Christ. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we I'll just get my Red Bull out of there. Today we are going to be celebrating your work, all the incredible stuff that you guys have been making over the past three months. And there's a lot of stuff. I've got over 600 images here. And I got four hours before I got a parent-teacher thing with my daughter. Um, and so I uh, don't think we're going to get through all of them. So we might have to split this over another episode. And, and uh, four hours is a long time for anybody to be watching a YouTube video anyway. Uh, and my studio is freezing cold. That's why I'm wearing my this jacket right now. It's officially winter here in Vancouver. Okay, so um, maybe just before we jump into things, just a quick like, subscribe, notification bell reminder. Um, if you like anything that you've seen in today's episode, or you will see in today's episode, um, or you, from on this channel in the past, please do me a favor and just uh, subscribe to the channel, like the bell, that all helps with the algorithm and all that kind of stuff. And helps more people see the work that we're doing here and join our community. Um, and if you want to support the channel uh, beyond that, you can even add a small donation via PayPal. You could donate through the Super Chat here within YouTube during the live stream. You could send an e-transfer uh, directly through email and or send a check in the mail. And if you want to contact me through my email, my email is on the Facebook group and on my website. Those links are in the description below. And um, yeah, thank you to everyone who supported this channel. Like the, the, the internet connection, the power for the lights, the, these cameras, pretty much everything you see around here is, is through your generous support over the last three, almost four years we've been doing this. So thank you everybody for your continued support so wow look at the chat there look at all the names uh barbara and deborah heist lisa uh senga alexi kathy jm cool look at all of these folks okay and many of you've got work that we're going to look at here in a moment so the way that I want to do this, I want to start by looking at the work that um, the paintings that you guys have recreated based on the Master Study series. And then I want to take a look at the drawings that were sent in. I think I got about 400 drawings. And then I want to look at the paintings that were you guys sent in um, that you've been working on on your own. So we got, um, yeah, we'll see how much of this we can get through. Now, I swear there are sometimes more images for some of these artists that I see on the Facebook group. And then when I'm putting them all together, I'm like, see, just one or two. Um, so let's, uh, let's start. Okay, so we're going to start here with Horace Pippin and take a look at, I think we've got three paintings submitted here. We've got Kathy, Deborah, and Paula, and uh, let's take a look at these here. Wow, these are beautiful. This is incredible. So... One thing, you know, I really liked um, Horace Pippin's work for, you know, the often very bright color and the way that he's applying paint, like the way that he painted all of the, the grass sort of individually. Um, and we see that in all three examples here. It looks like Deborah's replaced the dog with her own dog. 
Our own dog, Gracie, there. That's cool. Um, what can I offer here that, um, Kathy, um, I mean, that looks great. Same thing, Deborah. I mean, um, I even pa Paula here. I love, uh, again, Paula always draws this all by hand, so it's just amazing what you're able to do here, Paula. I, I mean, I, all I can do is just celebrate these paintings. I don't really, I mean, just can, thinking of, of Horace Pippin's kind of style, um, I don't know if there's anything I could offer to help improve on these paintings. Yeah, these look great. I'm, I just think they're really fantastic. Robin also did another... So I, in the Dropbox folder, I included this outline. Although I suspect this is either a for... The original is a forgery or a misattribution to Horace Pippin. Um, I, do, I really like the painting, but I, I just feel like it, maybe it doesn't belong to him. That's why I didn't do it as part of our class. But I love here that Robin did this painting. And then there was, an, we did a second episode uh, on Horace Pippin where we looked at his portrait of George Washington. And so Robin and Kathy both tried this one out. Uh, these are cool. I really, uh, these ones that Horace Pippin did I think are fantastic. I like his style here. Uh, very simplified, you know, you know, um, Almost verging on like a caricature or a cartoon, um, but and that's the way that mine kind of turned out. But his, actually, Robin, you did a, especially a great job of really capturing the the likeness really well and making it look even less cartoonish than than certainly mine did. For uh, absolutely, these are great and just the very simple palette. Very um, uh, muted colors, almost black and white. But the way that I approached this was mixing slightly different blacks. One kind of with an emphasis on warmer colors and another one with an emphasis on cooler colors. So you get that very subtle um, space that's created between those two. And so you can see here's this warmer blue versus this cooler um, brown in the background. In both instances... And Kathy and Robbins, that turned out really, really effective. Well done. Okay, let's just plow right ahead. Oh my goodness, wow. So here is um, uh, Mather Brown's portrait of Chevalier, uh, the Joseph Boulon de Chevalier uh, de Saint-Georges, um, who was you know, a, a great composer who happened to be uh, African in origin. And uh, there was a movie. I don't know, did the movie come out? I, I mean, partly I made this this uh, painting um, in anticipation of that film, and it seemed to just sort of come and go, I guess, because it must have been, I think it was supposed to come out about a month after this episode. But uh, anyway, here's Paula and Jillian's version. <laughs> These are great. Um, I'm, I'm curious if Jillian, if you cropped the original or there's, or the photo is just cropped. Because obviously there was, you know, the way that Paula's painted it shows that there was more um, of the figure included and little things in the background. I guess he did get the background included here. Um... What can I offer as feedback for either? I don't... Um, you know, I also did not... I don't think I did the notes in the... The the, uh, the sheet music in behind either. Looks like Paula you did that with just a couple little dots. Very nice. Um... You know, I wonder, Paula, have you tried using the glazing fluid that we use in class? I'd be interested to see if you use that glazing fluid, how well that worked for you. Because I think there's an opportunity to try using that glazing fluid. I think you might get... Because uh, I, I see in some of the other portraits that you've done, you've managed to get... Um, 
a little bit more uh, of a likeness here. And I think getting a little bit of glazing fluid, we could darken in a little bit with shadows um, uh, a little bit more. Maybe you are already using it, I don't know. Or, or sometimes it looks a little bit watery, but... Uh, beautiful. That's especially this, Jillian. I think you did a really fantastic. You actually captured the likeness of this figure's face really, really well. Wonderful. Uh, I'm going to keep on going through here because we got so much to do. Uh, so we did Beaufort Delaney's portrait of James Baldwin. Here's Paula's version of it there. And it looks like Paula was the only one who did this painting. I really liked how this painting turned out. Um, I'm surprised more people didn't do this painting. Um, what I love here, Paula, in your version is just really including all of those colors that uh, Beaufort Delaney really amplified through his work. So like that, the green and the blue, purple, really effective, really cool. And then, Paula, were you really the only one who did this portrait of a young musician? Interesting, okay. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes I feel like there's got to be more of these images. They just disappear into the Facebook group somehow. Um... But that's excellent. This is a... I really like how that turned out. I think... Yeah, these... Both of these turned out really well. This one in particular... And we're going to look at some other portraits that you did a little bit later on here, Paula. That are really amazing. And so I'm, I'm wondering kind of how you were able to take that leap from these images that we see here to some of the more recent portraits... Because there looks like a significant improvement in your drawing ability. So I'm curious how that, uh, um, how you, where you picked up those great skills. <laughs> okay, um, so I don't have anything really I can feel I can add to these here. I mean, I did do a few classes on drawing hands. So perhaps kind of watching some of those episodes and just looking at how I, uh, explained how to draw hands might might be really helpful um, let's go on to Palmer Hayden Palmer Hayden's here this is young girl reading another portrait by Paula as you can see Paula pretty much does every single painting from every single episode you're my rock Paula you're always there always uh, doing everything we do I really appreciate your constant involvement in all these episodes throughout the years Another great painting. It's always surprising, too, because this painting is originally a landscape format, and I notice you'll often take a landscape painting and turn it into a portrait format, and then sometimes do the opposite, take a portrait formatted image and turn it into a landscape. So, um, in this case, I, I don't... I think it's just because there was some more stuff over on the left. I think there was... Wasn't there? It was like a carpet, something else going on all over there. Um, let's see, and then this image here, uh, Palmer Hayden's The Legend of John Henry, here's Kathy's and Paula's. <laughs> I love Paula, looks like he's, he's gotten a little mustache going on there, I love that. <laughs> Both of these are great. Both of these are really great. Um, it's interesting too, because I think as we go on, I think you're really going to see Kathy, how your approach, uh, just goes leaps and bounds forwards. Not that this is a bad painting, but when we start seeing some of the other things that you're doing today, because this is back in February, so like what, seven months ago, um, you know, it's, there's, there is an improvement for sure. And so that's what's kind of just good every once in a while is to take a look back at some of your older work. And sometimes it can be really, really great just to kind of to reflect on how far one has come. I mean, I think all of the basics are here. But one of the things, if I recall with this painting, there was like some much darker glazing going on. And right now everything is like equally illuminated in this painting. And then I think there's a little bit more contrast and sort of uh, darkening down parts of the painting there. Um, and then Paula's That's Wild. He looks like, he looks a little bit wilder with his, with his hair. Maybe a little bit thinner. 
<laughs> Those jeans look like they are that uh, very, very tight around his waist. That's great. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're going to continue here with the work of Eva Gonzalez, one of the um, four women who exhibited alongside the, the male group of seven, or not group of seven, male impressionist painters. Uh, and most of her work was far more complex than, the, than this painting of these pink shoes. But um, I really liked this painting uh, and I thought it was kind of a, a nice little study and something that would be accessible for us to do in a shorter period of time. Um, one thing I really love is these reflections and the dark, dark background and how we can just keep on making it darker and darker and darker as we go. So I think this is very effective. Great job here, Kathy. I don't know how much more I can offer here. I think there might have been a little bit more texture in these... I don't know what you call them, like pom-poms or something, frills on the, on there. And then Paula's. Wow, that looks so dark. <laughs> I like how you included your shoe size in the comments. Um, uh, let's, let's see if, well, it's going to try brightening it. Well, let's try brightening this up to see if. That's maybe a little bit better. Very cool. One thing I would do is probably just darken this little bit here. So to emphasize that that pom-pom kind of popping forward, just sort of like you see here with Kathy's. So that it just makes that shoe not look quite so wide. And probably the reflection could be dimmed down and made a little bit more subtle. It's in fact almost a little bit brighter than the, the shoes themselves. So. We want them to be very, very subtle, like kind of like what you see here, how Kathy did that as well. I mean, not a big deal, but I just think, um, you know, if there's any little bits that I can share with you guys to help improve these paintings. Um, okay, here's another painting. Um, uh, Mahler's Portrait of Gogol. And the, the Gogol being the really the most important Ukrainian um, <laughs> author of all time, and a, a probably a, a I would just be, imagine considered to be a, a proto surrealist painter or author. Uh, I would start with well, if you haven't, the overcoat would be a great one. Just a great story or Diary of a Madman, all like five pages long really important um, stories, highly influential author. I love the way that you did this painting. I love his hair, how his face kind of gets is a little bit more narrow. His eyes are a little bit bigger. It gives him a bit of a childlike uh, appearance, which is obviously contradicted by the mustache. Uh, it makes So it, it looks, verges a little bit on caricature. Not that there's... Anything wrong with that, though? I love how that, that looks. Um, great brushwork, too, in the, in the clothing and the hair, or on the face, particularly. Well done. Um, oh, and there's Lolly in the chat, giving kudos to Paula. I love it. Okay, so let's move on here. What have I got? What's going on here? Ah. Okay, so we'll start with the orchid, uh, Henrietta Shore, uh, who was a, a really great Canadian British painter uh, who's we're gonna look at two of her paintings she did one of a, of a flower of an orchid 
and then the other of a, her cat. So let's start with the flower. That is beautiful. Great job. There's Heidi's and Kathy's. Kathy also did this flower too. And I think there was some modifications that you did here, Kathy. It looks like one of these leaves was removed. Why is it the main thing I'm noticing? The difference of um, added a leaf. Oh, so you added the leaf rather than took the leaf away. Interesting decision. I'm curious what uh, precipitated that. Just going back and forth. Uh, that, oh yeah, okay, so definitely, I love how we we get these little bits of purple in here. That makes a huge difference. Very cool. This was a, a really fun painting because it used a different technique that I don't know if we've used before or since, which was to paint kind of a darker uh, imprematura, basically, and then to apply lighter colors over top and to carefully leave a little bit of that imprimatur coming through in between the different shapes so that you kind of have the like the the glow is happening less through the shapes but through the the space the outlines in between those shapes right and i think this gives this painting a really nice glow really interesting approach that Henrietta Shore used for this artwork and I, again and obviously that's this is sort of Kathy's own spin on it this is the original based on Henrietta Shore's painting you Kathy was using the technique on that previous painting and then using it here very effective Kathy and Heidi Paula Paula didn't quite use the same technique or approach just to use the composition of the flower. Um, but um, I don't know if I can think of too many other artists or paintings that employ this technique. But I could see, you know, a lot of other people trying it out. And so if you've never, if you haven't heard or done this technique before... It might be worth going back and investigating, uh, trying this episode again, because I think uh, it's it was something I had never done before, never even really occurred to me before until we studied Henrietta Shore's artwork. So, um, you know, unless you've you've heard of a technique like that, then you, you'll never know that you can do it or that it can be applied to maybe something else you're creating here. So I love these. These are great. I think maybe, Kathy, you could darken a little bit more, just adding a little bit more shadow in a few places, but otherwise, fantastic work. And then we'll look at, the, at Henry Shore's cat. Here's Paula's version and Kathy's version. Wonderful. That's very effective. Both really, really good. That's wild. Excellent. Um... What could I say? I mean, I, it's actually quite funny. Like, the way that Henry Shore painted the, the face of the cat looks almost kind of human-like. A little bit less so here in Kathy's painting. But I think, Paula, you really captured it. it. It reminds me a little bit more of, like, a Alice in Wonderland type of character. And it's just interesting to think about how our de way we've drawn, painted pets like dogs and cats has changed it's debatable as to how much cats and dogs themselves have changed over the course of history as people have been uh, making paintings of them depicting them in art but they, uh, they they seem to have changed the way that we've we've looked at them or at least the way artists have looked at them has changed very cool um okay Thing is, I have loads more drawings I've not uploaded yet. 
Well, I think we've got about 30 of yours already here to look at. So um, you'll be, I think, we're, we're good for right now. Um, okay, so let's move on here. Uh, Florine Stettheimer is our next artist. This was a really fun episode where we used some uh, multimedia, some other materials, and we used the paint to glue those materials to the canvas. So again, you may or may not be as interested in the artist or even in the subject of the work, but watching that video just to see how you can use paint to uh, to as a as a glue basically because after all acrylic paint is very similar to white glue so you can use acrylic paint as a gluing agent and uh, here in this case what we did is we glued uh, fabric down uh, into the pa wet paint and then how did I make these uh, flowers I think I used a Sort of, I, I think I just took a, a, a Ziploc bag, put the paint in there, and then cut the edge off and kind of uh, squeezed it out like I was piping cake uh, uh, icing um, or icing onto a cake. <laughs> uh, that's great. This turned out really good, Kathy. That's really fantastic. And wow, Paula's. You know what's interesting, Paula, the way this one looks, and what material is that? Is that also fabric you glued in there? Cool. It almost looks like in yours, um, Paula, that that it's like a... Uh, you know, like you're some sort of gymnast in a circus or something, or Cirque du Soleil, and that this is some sort of ring that she's sitting on that is maybe high above the crowd, whereas... These ones, I, I mean, I suppose you could see it that way. These ones, I think that that in circle, which is originally not a perfect circle either, right? So um, it was always kind of a little bit wonky, the, the circle that Florine herself did. And then here's Robin's version. And it's hard to tell. Oh, that's, a, that's a piece. Because I used, well, that's right, I used... Um, uh, uh, from a screen, like an insect screen door material. That's what I use. So maybe that's what Robin used there as well. Uh, she says, I tried using impasto medium for the 3D flowers, but it sunk as it dried. So that's, that's something that is good to notice. That definitely some um, mediums that you can mix into the paint that will, that claim to thicken the paint will th will thicken it but maybe not as much as one expects because after all um, whatever material that you, you mix a medium that you mix into acrylic paint is generally water based and for it to remain in its fluid state it needs to, to have water and the water has to evaporate for it to solidify so it's going to lose some of its density. It's going to, to shrink down a little bit as it dries, some more than others. So that's why it's kind of nice just to, to do these episodes to test out your materials and see for yourself how well the, the medium is going to hold its shape as it dries. So in this case, I think, Robin, you kind of learn, wow, that material is certainly not holding its shape as maybe as much as one might expect it to. Uh, Paula, I don't think, um, yeah, d sorry, I didn't have the right materials. I just uh, painted directly into it. Um, yeah, it still looks fine. looks great. And how did Kathy's work? Yeah, that's turned out great. Very cool. I love how these, these work turned out. Okay. Now let's continue with the Paula show here. So uh, here's William Blake's paintings that we did for Easter. And here's her crucifixion, resurrection. And then this is the ghost of a flea that we did just a few weeks ago for Halloween. So, wow. I mean, <laughs> um, 
I, I mean, I actually was just last night watching a whole documentary on William Blake, and what a, I mean, I obviously did a bunch of research for these episodes, but he's just one of those characters that just uh, is infinitely uh, inspiring and uh, fascinating figure in art history. Someone totally plowing his own field, not going in the direction of the rest of the world, which is one of the reasons I admire him so greatly. Uh, so that turned out great. I love how vibrant this is. This also reminds me of... Um, let me see. Odilon Redon um, was... Great. Uh, I think it was a French painter. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much of his work we're going to see here. Oops. I don't feel like those paintings really remind me so much of his work. There's one in particular that your painting just inspired me to look up. It is like a crucifixion. Anyway, there's something just about the the looseness as to which he painted that I feel like is a little bit in, in here. Wow, I love the way you did the hands here, Paula. That's great. I mean, the figure is a little bit out of proportion, and certainly if you wanted to do the drawing course, and, and especially some of the, the episodes I did on uh, human proportions, I think that might help you get to draw this figure a little bit closer to its original proportions having said that William Blake's original work is also you know a little bit uh, the anatomy I would say is not entirely accurate <laughs> um, William Blake definitely took a lot of liberties so I don't mind that you know these arms feel a little bit shorter than maybe they should be or that the waist is a little bit higher right his looks like he's there should be a little bit more room for Jesus's uh, six pack, his abs here. <laughs> um, but uh, but this also feels very much in the spirit of William Blake. William Blake being kind of like a visionary who um, just painted uh, restlessly, uh, despite you know the the tastes of the time. And this is great, too. This is actually very... The way that you've painted this, the ghost of a flea here, Paula, I love. Because it is kind of creepy. You know, the way... like the It actually reminds me a little bit more of the original. Mine, I took a lot of liberties because I felt it was pretty hard to see some of the details that they had. The painting has deteriorated so much. And here you've managed to kind of take the painting in a little bit more of a, of a frightening direction. That face... And the eye, the fact that it's all solid black, makes it really hard to see which direction it's looking. It might be looking over its shoulder at us, um, or William Blake, the the or the painter yourself, perhaps. Right, very very creepy. Um, Senga says thank you. I loved all your drawing lessons. Thank you, Senga. Yeah, from the look of the artwork you created, it was awesome. We're going to celebrate your work here shortly. Let's look at Kathy's. Well, we're, we're going to look at Cassius Coolidge or Cash Coolidge's dogs playing poker. And there's Kathy and Eula and 
Daniel's version. Wow. Digital rendition. That's something a little bit different. <laughs> Paul is that's great. Uh, okay. Um, well, maybe let's start here with Paula's. Oh, wow. I like how, actually, it feels like you, you zoomed out a little bit. We've got a little bit more room in the foreground. Uh, in his painting, a lot of this area is, um, it's a little bit closer cropped, but it's also a bit darker. Uh, it's a little bit more, which gives it a bit more of a, I was going to say sinister, but just a little bit, a, a moodier painting where, you know, you've got these four dogs sitting around smoking cigars, drinking and playing poker. Um, and, you know, it, it has that look of like, a, you know, maybe not a, not fully legal sort of um, situation, right? Thinking about, like, the era that this painting would have been made in, you know, gambling and alcohol and, you know, cigars were, were probably all associated by some people, not necessarily everybody, but, but by some people as being, um, you know, uh, vices that uh, were causing the downfall of Western culture and so kind of by having a little bit, I mean, I even, I mean, I, to be honest, I'm not really sure if I recall off the top of my head, uh, Coolidge's motivation for making this painting. And maybe he was, he painted them all as dogs in order to kind of emphasize the, the, you know, the, the absurdity or, or ridicule these characters in some way, you know, or the real life men who play and drink, you know, uh, anyway, so I think this is closer to the original, um, Kathy's version, the original cropping of this painting. You see that we don't see the chairs in their entirety as Paula has done. Um, these, these two, uh, dogs here on the left are really well done and they're all there. Everyone's very smiley and happy. This dog looks like he's having no fun. He's out. He's done. And this one, he looks... He almost looks a little bit more like a... A ferret or something. Like that... His nose... Is... So right now, the nose is sort of facing us. But we only see one, one eye. So... It's sort of like, I'm trying to think how to show this. It's sort of like what we see is one eye, but but more of this nose. Does that make sense? So in order for that nose to make sense, we should see the other eye here, or this whole nose should get shifted to the front of the snout, and so we should only see one nostril there. Not a big deal. But I think it's just that little bit of confusion as to um, which direction is this face looking? Is it kind of looking towards us? Because if we put the other eye here, it might look like that dog is like kind of looking towards us. Or if we just, if the snout, we just see one eye, it's like the dog is looking across the table at the other dogs. So just maybe thinking about which direction you want that dog to be looking in. Eula's here is very effective. It's interesting the way you've painted this, Eula. Um, how would I describe how it's painted? Um, there's like a fuzziness. This works really well with these dogs. Really good job in... Um, it gives it just a hairiness, which is what we would expect from some dogs. Um, you know, I think one of the things with this painting is I think we could you could continue glazing kind of endlessly, darkening and darkening and darkening and darkening and adding more and more shadows. 
and potentially even highlighting and lightening a few areas up. This is a really complex painting. There's a lot of detail in this painting. So to be able to do it justice is, you know, takes a long time. And I think you've done a really good job. I took out some of the cigars and cigarettes in there and even some of the glasses, uh, both because I didn't want to have cigarettes in my image. Um, uh, but also there was, it was just Again, try, I had to try to remove some de details just to keep this painting a little bit easier on myself. I think what's nice is I see here, Yula, you've taken out some of the details. Like I think there's a bookshelf back here, and I did paint that in, but you decided to rather than spend time down here in the background to spend that time on the table, which I think is actually a very smart decision, right? Because it's not the the background here i don't know how important that actually is and i probably spent you know 45 minutes back there it might have been better spent on the table or in the foreground as you've done so i think that was a really smart strategy and daniel's version here this digital drawing of the dogs playing poker is very wild um it's kind of it turns out to be like a really kind of uh crazy abstract image like i mean if you don't know the context or the original source material for this painting it does become very strange um it does feel like this, that these you know it now it feels more like these dogs are kind of hovering over the table kind of like having a uh, you know like they're they're plotting something you know they're looking down maybe they're you know it's like something out of like a horror movie or something where there's all of these chips and think maybe the chips are actually people or something and they're all you know uh, looking up in horror at these terrible monsters playing games with them or something Something very kind of ominous about your version of this painting. And Kathy's, I think, did a fantastic job. I think, again, you could probably get away with darkening a little bit of the chairs on the sides just to kind of focus people's attention towards the center of the painting and away from the edges. Not bad, but uh, just something I, I think is worth noting. Okay. <laughs> and I love all these comments here. Uh, awesome. I love how supportive you guys are of one another, and and the such generous comments in the in the uh, the chat there, celebrating each other's work. That makes it just makes me feel good for humanity that that's happening. Okay. Um, so now we're going to look at Helen Galloway McNichol, uh, a great Canadian Impressionist painter, although she didn't officially exhibit with the Impressionist painters. She is considered to be one of the, the artists who really introduced Impressionism to Canada and North America. Uh, I really liked this painting. Just a really beautiful you know, essentially, I was going to say simple painting, but anyone who tried doing this painting probably realized it's a little more complex than, than maybe it appears. These are great. I also really like your version here, Paula. Your version has a little bit more of a greener grass, so it feels a little bit more springtime-ish, whereas both Maria's and Kathy's have a little bit more of that... Uh, late summer early fall kind of yellow and you know a pastel like the this this reminds me of calgary in in september kind of thing everything's starting to kind of go a little bit yellow or after the snow has just melted maybe very very you know early spring too perhaps um whereas paula's feels like you know this could be a summer day uh, really great I love all these different interpretations as a painting. You can see how 
each one of you applied the paint in a slightly different way. Um, here, Kathy's brush strokes, I like how they kind of go away, kind of they, it's almost, it makes it feel like she's kind of at the center of some sort of vortex or something, and that the, the ground is moving around her, framing her in some way. Um... It's interesting here that Maria, the way that you chose to paint this is by moving her her whole body kind of up and to the left. So you ended up focusing more on the grass. It's really the grass occupies roughly um, basically half of this painting if we add it all up. When in reality, it's maybe, you know, a third of the painting. Excuse me, a little bit. Uh, I was up till 4.30 in the morning last night putting together today's episode, and then I've been all day long. Put As soon as I got up at 7.30, took my daughter to school, came back, and I've been getting this. So I've probably put about 25 hours of prep time into today's episode. There's so much work you guys uploaded. So forgive me if I'm... If I'm uh, running on a little bit of fumes here. <laughs> there's just so much work which is again that's a great i'm not even a problem it's it's a great thing to have so much engagement i can't even believe i i gotta say like when i was like going through these paintings i was just like i cannot believe how fortunate i am to be a part of this community there's so much work that there's like now over a thousand hundred or so people who belong to our Facebook group who are uploading images consistently. It's just, that blows my mind. Anyway, sorry, just as a quick tangent, I've, something I'd, it's, I, I, it's, it's wild <laughs> this is happening. Um, so uh, I don't know how much I can offer to anybody here with these. I mean, maybe Paula, what I would say just a little thing about her face. Uh, I think her chin is going to be a little bit smaller. And right now, this kind of yellow color makes it look like she's got a little bit of a beard. right? She, it kind of makes her look a little bit like a Jesus-like figure. Or that she's got like that an Amish beard of some kind. And I think that could be corrected by using this kind of uh, white and cool blue cool yellow like a teal and just painting a little bit underneath her chin in there and perhaps even just trying to add a little bit of an eyelash or two on either side just to make her look a little bit more feminine um, because yeah right now it does look a little bit like a beard really excellent job I love the way you painted her face. That, better than mine. Where did... I know mine's around here somewhere. Um, but that's really nice. I love how you painted her face, Maria. Really great job. Excellent, excellent version. I, I love how, what you did here. Um, and it's this is a great example of how... The Impressionists used opposing colors. So instead of using black, I mean, obviously there's a little bit of black in her shoes, but for the most part, Impressionists, rather than using black for shadows, they would just use the opposite, a darker version of the opposite color. So here we have all of these yellows. So what is opposite of yellow on the color wheel? Purple, right? So employing all this purple in the shadows on her clothes and behind and in the grass is is like textbook 101 impressionism and obviously as i said uh, mcnichol was a uh, canadian impressionist painter really the, the probably arguably one of the first artists to paint within the impressionist style in canada so this is like a textbook um, uh, deployment of that technique in, in this work. Same sort of thing here, Kathy. It's interesting, yours, 
same painting, but a little bit um, more, almost like Bonard, the way that, who, whose artwork we just spent the past month really looking at, how kind of soft his edges are, much less defined. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I like both of these paintings on their own for totally different reasons. Like this one feels, it reminds me of Impressionism as well in the fact that it's, it's is a little bit indistinct, very kind of spontaneous, very few brush strokes. Um, she looks a little bit more sad here and contemplative, like she's just sort of looking down into the grass off to the side here, kind of, you know, maybe a little bit worried, her expression there. Versus here, um, in Maria's painting, she looks, maybe even like her eyes are closed and she looks, you know, a little bit content. Maybe she's meditating or something. Um, so I just, I love seeing how slightly different artworks can just evoke totally different feelings. And same sort of thing here. Paula's, you know, almost, she looks almost like smiling and she's looking off to the side. So I look at that, it's almost like I expect to see like a little dog looking up at her that she's smiling at or something. Okay, um, how far do we want to go today? Well, let's look at how many more? One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's do yeah. Let's do six more artists, and then we're gonna start looking at the drawings. So here's uh, Hiroshige the. Um, one of, if not the greatest Japanese, uh, well, I was going to say artist of all time, but certainly of his era, um, him and Hokusai would be considered to be the, the two great uh, uh, modern Japanese artists, highly influential. This particular artwork was famously reproduced several times by Vincent van Gogh, who was a collector of Japanese prints as they started to flood the, the, the European market in the 1850s and 60s, 70s, um, and just created a like continental shift in the way that artists in Europe uh, used space and, and dimension, how they, and often going out of the way to either exclude or tinker with geometric perspective. And so anyway, I really like this, your version here, Paula. This was a little bit of a tricky painting. Uh, all of the details that, it was, this took me a little bit of time to do. And, you know, at the very, very end, after doing all of that detail, I put those dark lines right through the, the you know, that were uh, the rain. I put them in at the very end, and it was sort of a little bit like, I hope this works, because I'm about to draw lines right over top of a painting I just spent the last five hours painting. And it did turn out really well. I used the, my um, Posca pens, the acrylic paint pens, to draw those lines as opposed to painting them with a brush. Uh, yeah, it's also interesting, again, Paula, how this the original artwork is a portrait format so the original painting is is vertically oriented and here you've turned it into a horizontally oriented painting like a landscape orientation which is funny to me that because you often we talked saw an earlier painting that was landscape formatted but you chose to paint it in a vertical format so I'm always curious as to what motivates you to to um change the orientation of the painting when you when you paint it like this if it's just a, a the size or shape of the paper you have at the moment or in your sketchbook but um i do think you know doing that especially because you're drawing these images out yourself uh, it does give you the opportunity to um, play with the original composition in some way and to see if 
there might be an alternative that might say something different, might change the um, the meaning in some way, or add something new to it. So, um, you know, design is just very fun. Very fun that you're that that's something the choice that you made. Um, you guys are so sweet. Uh, Eula says, thank you so much for the feedback. It's incredible to have this. Kathy says, wow, so dedicated and so lucky to have Michael as our teacher. Thank you so much. Barbara says, wow, thanks, Michael. We really appreciate your support and time. <laughs> uh, Sengus is such a nice guy. You can see he just loves his work and getting more people inspired, and it's inspiring him. Good guy. Um, Senga says, touches me when I hear him say about his near accident and how he wants to leave all these teachings for his daughter. Oh, that's true. Oh my goodness. Eulis is at such a welcoming space here. Thank you everybody for being such amazing and kind human beings. Oh, I, just such a wonderful celebration of positivity and community. It just makes me so happy. Um... So let's uh, let's move on here. Let's look at these works by Tyrus Wong. Uh, Tyrus Wong being a really important artist in Southern California history. Essentially, the look of Disney's Bambi was based on his artwork. He also worked for a long time uh, at the Walt Disney Company as an animator, mostly as like a scene painter, as as the artist who inspired many of the the images for a lot of uh, Disney movies and television shows throughout the 50, 40s, well, 50s and 60s. Um, and also, if, if you recall that episode, also put up with a tremendous amount of, um, of discrimination at being a Japanese-American in, um, in the United States. And, well, he was, if I recall, interned in was it Manzanar? <sighs> a terrible moment in um, in Western history. So this paint, I I really liked. I mean, I love the whole story of Tyrus Wong. There's a great documentary called Tyrus about Tyrus Wong's life and bio about well his life and his art. Um, I highly encourage you to watch. It it was it did the rounds of the film festivals maybe five, ten years ago or something. Um, uh, but uh, this particular image was used on a Reader's Digest cover to, um, uh, I think it was to promote the movie Bambi when it, had, when it well, no. Maybe, I guess Disney was re-releasing those movies. Maybe it was for the, the home VHS release of Bambi. I'm trying... We, this, we did this episode way back in, what, March or something, so I'm trying to remember the, the story behind this artwork. Really cool. I also just think it's what's fun about what Tyrus did here is he kind of took this traditional Asian, Japanese, Chinese approach to landscape painting and sort of made it modern and included this this subject matter like the Bambi this deer into it so it's um it, it's yeah it's just this kind of wonderful meeting place between this ancient approach to to painting um and depicting space and the landscape and also uh you know this contemporary well relatively contemporary cartoon really cool great job here kathy i love how you did the background you know it's very hard to get that transition of from darker uh, colors to lighter colors or from cool to warm cool here's paula's the deer is losing a little bit of detail as we go back here it's I mean, it's now pixelated but you know, those antlers have kind of widened out a little bit. I think that's probably something that... Because I know that you've sometimes used 
a pen or a pencil to do those details that are that small I think you could have done as with a pen instead of trying to paint it with a brush because it kind of made it a little bit hard to see the individual um, branches of the antler okay here's Kim Kwang Ho the great Korean North Korean painter uh, who sadly sort of seemed to just disappear um, into North Korea. Uh, this I really like this painting, and you've done a great job here, Paula, especially considering that you drew this out by eye uh, as opposed to using the template. Really, really, especially the woman on the right here. Uh, every, it's very well done, like in terms of her proportion, really well done. And you've done it, you know, the, the glow that we see here with this warm yellow imprimatur kind of coming through, you've really captured really, really well here. That's pretty cool. I'm really, really psyched about that. That's cool. Um, okay, we're going to look at Oji Ho. I'm not sure how big of a painting this is, Angelica. Uh, looks great, though. There's Angelica, Kathy's, Maria's, and Paula's. And everyone did a kind of different version, I mean, or, or reinterpreted in such different ways. Hmm. Uh, I mean, I guess let's start with uh, Angel Angelica, Angelica. What, what do you think it is, Angelica or Angelica? Angelica, probably, right? That sounds more common. Um, what can I offer here? I think this is really well painted. I'm trying to remember how the original looked. I mean, this one, what I see is, um, like, the way that the, the, the petals of the flowers are painted are, are actually quite rectangular, and so, uh, which I don't mind. I feel like this is a, a, a reinterpretation of this painting in a, in a more, um, what would be the word, a... the style like you really simplified all of these forms into very basic shapes and it's starting to really verge on abstraction here um, I, th I think it's great I, I like that one might look at it and be slightly um, uh, well, what would you say slightly the, 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 these forms start to become a bit more ambiguous, I think is, is kind of nice. It's kind of nice. Here, Kathy, I think, is, is painted a little bit closer towards the original. And what is nice here is, is those darker shapes under the lily pads really helps create a lot of dimension here. So I think potentially... I don't know why, I mean, now that this painting is becoming a little, because you can also see a lot of those lily pads, rather than, than being kind of done in perspective, where we're seeing, you know, a little bit more oval shapes, they're much more, like, flat, like we're seeing. Let's illustrate this idea. So it's, it's sort of like, in the, if we look at Kathy's here, you see how, well, let's, well, maybe not. I was going to say that, you know, in this, the original, we sort of see the lily pads kind of from the side and that they're a little bit more, 
But it does look like, you know, he's kind of looking at it from above. Like, we're seeing mostly the very circular shape as opposed to more of an oval shape. So, I guess you, you did it right. It's just, there's something more Kandinsky-like about this kind of image. I'm not sure why. Huh. And Maria... Oh, th this is the same. Maria, okay. Oh, I'm not sure why. Okay. I guess I get confused with a different name on Facebook here. So, these are the same... Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it still looks a little... It's verging more on, on abstraction here. I think potentially if we darkened some things and lightened a few things, we might create a little bit more of a realistic type of scene where it looks more photographic. But I don't think that's necessarily necessary or... Paul is here, you really... The color is very exuberant. You've also... Again, once again, taking a painting that at one time was vertically oriented and then turned it into a landscape again. <laughs> so, you know, all of this grass or uh, reeds or whatever they might be, leaves, there was only a couple of them bending in from the edge. Well, maybe like five or six of them. And you've turned this into a whole mass of them creeping in from the side. Almost like as if they are on a little bit raised area and water and the leaves are kind of flowing over into the uh, into a lower basin type of thing. And I feel like you've also articulated those flowers, made them much um, more blooming yeah just very different paintings this this feels much more expressive i feel like in paula's your painting it feels like there's a lot more movement in this painting uh, very expressive the way that it's painted versus like maria's painting feels much slower uh, in fact, that almost looks like a, like a reflection of the sky. It makes me definitely makes me feel like I'm looking almost straight down into the water, and that's what I see. I can almost feel like I, I should see the top of my head reflected in here. And then Kathy's here. I feel like I see it from a little bit of a different angle, like I'm looking down at it rather than straight down, even though the lily pads are drawn almost identically. Um, yeah, it's just such a... That's just kind of it's that's strange to me that that would happen okay and I love this artist here Abdul Latif Mohideen um, and these images he created are so wild that's great huh uh I don't know what else I can add to this. This looks like you had a lot of fun here, Paula. I like seeing all the layering of paint. So we get all these like little bits of blue and yellow and pink and green and brown all over here. Rather than just painting it white, there's just so much going on. It's just so, like texture-wise, just mm, it looks just so nice. I love it. Kathy, same sort of thing. In fact, I would almost say, Kathy, we could have a little bit more of what Paula's got here. Just a little bit more smearing and blending. Perhaps that could have been done with just a little bit more transparency when we went painted over the colors in the background with that white. Because that white is very opaque. And I know I know that you painted colors. I can see that kind of brown coming through. But unfortunately, it seems to have got a little bit lost under under that thicker coat of white. Not a big deal. I mean, I still really like your painting. I just think that that, that is... And, and maybe, honestly, what you've done might be closer to the original. It might be just like how I painted it, too. 
I'm just looking at the way Paula's done hers and thinking, wow, that turned out really cool. That's really wild. Maybe we should all have done it like that. I, cause I can't remember how my own painting turned out. Um, yeah, and Kathy's saying the same thing, Paula. Great job. Okay, now we're going to look at Tetsugoro Orozu. And I love this painting that he did. This is so cool. What a beautiful painting. I'm so glad. This is one, another one of those was like, ah, oh, I'm running out of time. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to this painting. And I was like, you know what? we got to do this one. I just think it's so cool. He's a, another really great artist who's got so much great stuff that we could spend months doing a bunch of his work. So... If, you're, if you liked this painting, and it looks like a, a few of you did here, you may want to consider looking a little bit further into his work. Because he was, he's definitely um, one of the Japanese artists that was really ahead of his time in terms of like modern art in Japan. Uh, whereas a lot of other artists were still painting in a much more traditional manner, he was really ex kind of exploring... Um, because his work has a lot of different... I think we, we did a, we did two of his paintings, right? He, um, he really explored, like, cubism and fauvism and impressionism and really tried a whole bunch, as many different styles as possible. He's considered to be having been really important in introducing uh, Western art to Japan, for better or worse, right? Uh, so here's Kathy's, Deborah's, Paula's, and Richards. Wow. Let me just get my tea bag out of here. Okay. Um, well, maybe let's start here, Richard. Really well done. I think this is the first painting of yours today we're looking at, Richard. You've got a bunch more coming up, but... Um, what is to say here? Let me, let me just take a look at how other people painted this painting. Okay, so what I was, what I was looking at is this face, because I was trying to think, is there something about... This nose that is I'm not quite understanding. And I think if we look at the way kind of Kathy and Deborah and Paula painted it, um, you could see that uh, he's chosen to kind of darken maybe one side and keep one side a little bit lighter. Because that's often the case. Generally, it's a good idea if you're lighting someone. Sometimes you want to have even light, especially if you're painting a female subject. You kind of want even light to kind of de-emphasize some of the facial features. And um, Whereas with male figures, you can pretty much throw all sorts of light on there and get terrible shadows, and, um, and it's not, uh, not such a worry. But often, you kind of want to kind of maybe light from either even lighting or just a very subtle shadow on one side of the face. So here you can see around this eye, it's uh, kind of left a little bit. There's no dark lines. Versus in Richard's, we have that eyebrow kind of continue into the bridge of the nose. And, you know, stylistically, I don't mind. I think it's, it does, though, feel like... This side, it could be darker, but I don't know about that sharp line. Not a big deal. Again, I'm just super nitpicky. <laughs> uh, and just thinking of like things to help. But the other thing too is this hand. That thumb, I think, should either be just a little bit shorter or these fingers should be a little bit longer. And we only also only have three... Uh, well, I mean, I have four fingers, but these three fingers plus the thumb. So I think we're missing, like, a pinky there. Uh, and so what I usually do is just kind of would suggest it, maybe, with just a tiny little bit of, of skin tone 
around there. But because that thumb is almost as long as the rest of the fingers, or you could say the fingers are just about as short as the thumb, it could create a confusion so that we're, we become kind of not aware as to, you know, it's like, is it this hand? This hand or this hand? Like, So you could see with, with this thumb here, right? That's sort of what, what it's supposed to look like, right? But it could also look like that instead, which would make, you know, and that maybe her thumb is hiding. And now, of course, that wouldn't make any sense, right? Because that wouldn't make sense for that arm to be crossing over her body because that arm is holding the parasol over her shoulder. But just those that little detail like that can create a slight confusion in the in the mind of the viewer. And I think we just want to... Generally, you don't want to create that kind of confusion. Um, Paul is here again. So what's kind of neat to see here, Paula, is how your your technical approach, you know, lends your paintings like a real intensity, like a movement. They feel very dynamic, like the water splashing up around her ankles here. Um, you know, it, it makes her feel like she's right in that ocean, like she's, you know, posing in... in on, on some rocks that are, you know, it's it's getting a little bit uh, rough, right? Versus, you know, Richard's is there, but these waves feel li not quite as 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 I was gonna say violent, as active or dynamic. Um, Deborah's though, you know, these sweeping lines coming through here. Uh, do give it a sense of that uh, it is a little bit stormier. It's interesting that we're missing a little bit of her legs down there too, and eh? her ankles. I like this though. Yeah, I don't know how much I can offer these. I like how this is done. Oh, Kathy, what can I say? Her expression here on her mouth seems pretty kind of a little bit downturned. And her eyes seem like she's kind of, you know, her eyes look kind of wide open and she's looking intensely. And her mouth is kind of downturned. So she looks a little bit unhappy here. Here she also looks a little bit sour, <laughs> too. Here, Paula's, I think, done, she looks a little bit more, or her eyes also look pretty intense. Or, is that how the original looked? The eyes so intense. Wow. Richard's one, though, she looks more calm and peaceful, I would say. And just thinking about that, it's just, it's interesting that there's that juxtaposition between, you know, the, her, the, the model's emotion and the landscape around, and the landscape being kind of, you know, this water churning up and splashing against the rocks, and the figure being themselves perhaps a little bit, uh, um, the mind is is uh, unquiet or disturbed, perhaps, or at peace. And so I think it's an interesting juxtaposition uh, that the artist did here to either, well, juxtaposition or complement, that the those waves could, ref could add to the kind of internal chaos that the model might feel, or act as opposition, like look how this, per look how calm this person is in the face of this like wild nature uh, unfolding around around her. So just kind of thinking about like when you're creating your own paintings, how you can uh, amplify or counter the emotion of the central subject by surrounding it with with things 
that uh, might be, you know, have a lot of movement or, or very still, right? So, like, for instance, the way, I mean, the examples I always use is, like, Edward Munch's The Scream, you know, that figure, ah, right? Well, that figure is is going through this existential crisis, and Edward Munch used warm colors in the background, cool colors in the foreground, which is sort of the opposite of the way that I encourage you to use color. But he did that deliberately to create this sort of feeling of like, of confusion, like that the background is coming forward, the foreground's going backwards. And so that the viewer just feels a little bit disoriented themselves and maybe feels a little bit what that screaming figure is feeling. So... And I think, so I think that is like really clever. It's like, okay, I want people, I want to show this person going through this inner turmoil. How can I, you know, and I can show someone kind of like screaming, but what can I do with the area around them that might further um, uh, emphasize that anxiety that the character feels? Well, what if I create a background like the sky a very swirly sky it just feels like you know the it's like the apocalypse or something going on there right so uh, another artist who's really great at that would be Frida Kahlo and the way that she surrounds um, her like so she's often painting portraits of herself and surrounding herself with monkeys and birds and uh uh, panthers and all sorts of wild animals animals that that were probably not laying next to her in her bed while she's making those paintings um in order to kind of give the painting a sense of like of danger and wildness right that that uh, uh because she's she's trying to she's trapped in her bed because of her accident and of her health condition. So by surrounding herself with all these wild animals, it, it both makes it seem like, you know, she's, you know, it emphasizes maybe some of the feelings that she has inside of kind of, of, um, of like a desperation to, to find some sort of freedom from her, the condition in which she finds herself in that moment. Okay. So, this will be our the final artist we're going to look at before we move into looking at some drawings. <laughs> uh, these are great. Again, I feel like the, I'm sure there's more than four paintings there on, on the... And really just... Uh, three? There's got to be more than three paintings here so there's Kathy's this is what version yeah that's version one version two Jillian and Paula's I mean what's so interesting you could probably if you've been paying attention now for the last little bit seeing all of the the, the work uh, by these three artists kind of appearing again and again you can see their styles kind of coming to, through here so we could see like in Kathy's approach you know it's like a very kind of clean and precise approach to painting you know Jillian's got a little bit more of a, of a how would I say what would be the word to describe a little bit more of a this reminds me of like the, the artist Lucian Freud um, who passed away relative we should we need to do a Lucian Freud episode for sure uh, and um, Lucian Freud had a bit more of like a messy chunky textured technique and I feel like I feel that in this particular work here and then Paula's style here um, in which things are also even more loose and a little bit more dynamic and so these these three paintings painted in different styles you know in th this painting here we you know both of these figures appear to be quite young 
Um, in Jillian's, I guess all of you seem to have painted them. Maybe Jillian's, they look maybe the oldest of the three. <laughs> One thing, I, these uh, eyes, she's really looking him up, burning, like his neck must be on fire, because look at those eyes just roasting him. <laughs> So one thing to think about when you're when you're painting eyes or drawing eyes is is rarely do our eyes um, rarely do you ever see white all the way around an iris, right? Like I like I'm opening my eyes as wide as I can right now. I'm starting to feel pain in my forehead, and I cannot get it so I can get a little bit of white around, right? I mean, obviously I can open my eyes like that, but otherwise I can't do it. You, and if my eyes are relaxed, right, then we, then the, the iris, which is the part of your eye that's hazel or green or brown or blue or whatever, most of it is being, the, that circle is being clipped in the top and bottom. Like if you imagine like a neutral core, right? And that's my eye. Most and so this is your iris, right? Your iris is sort of being, you know, you know, covered by your top eyelid and your bottom eyelid, right? Versus here in your painting, Kathy. You know, we see all that those circles of the iris are much bigger, and so it really gives her this look of like that she's looking at him pretty carefully. Or like, where, how is she looking? Kind of like... <laughs> you know, it's like she's some sort of like a kidnapping victim and, and she's afraid to, to make any... You know, she's sort of like looking at the person. Grab the pitchfork and set me free. Help me get away from this crazy man. <laughs> right? Um, versus, you know, in Jillian's painting, her look is much more, uh, well, I don't know how loving it is. Here she's probably, she looks like she's just like, my husband is an idiot. <laughs> like, this guy, what an idiot, right? And both of them she actually seems to be maybe she looks up to him a little bit, but he seems like he's a little bit clueless. I find it so funny looking at paintings and trying to kind of assess out who the people are, the personalities that are in there. Um. <laughs> Need to see here. I see in the comments. Deborah's talking about, uh, I liked how my face was sour. I spent time trying to get the water just right, so I felt grumpy with my water. Also, my tracing the drawing was too large for my canvas. I was a grumpy person. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, Paul says how we're channeling emotion and art. Uh, Senga says, I can't wait to start the painting classes. That would be great. I would, can't wait to see you start painting too. That would be really neat. Now that you're, you've you've been working. Your, are you done the drawing class already, Senka? Or are you still working your way through those episodes? And uh, Kathy says I la laughed a lot while getting the face right. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's you know a, a good thing. I think it's a really a good thing to laugh w when you're making your own artwork. I've probably said before, but I am constantly, when I'm drawing by myself, just laughing out loud, you know, looking at what I'm producing. I think, and I think that's really healthy to kind of, to be surprised and, you know, yeah, it doesn't mean you have to accept everything. You know, sometimes you're like, oh, I could fix that. I'm not really happy with it. That turned out, but it's, I think, better to uh, laugh at your work than to um, beat yourself up about 
when your paintings don't um, achieve your meet your expectations for them. Um, this thing is, I finished the drawing course. Wow, that is awesome. No wonder you have lots more artwork to upload. Oh, cool. Okay. So, where is our things here? Okay, here we are. Whew. Okay, I was like, what? Where where did everything go? Okay. So let me get myself a, a little bit more caffeine in here. Hear that? Sounds like an ocean. Okay, so just before we we move on to looking at the drawings that you guys sent in, just a quick reminder to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Um, you know, we do these episodes ideally once a month, but it looks like every couple months or every three months in today's case. If you want to support the channel with a small donation through PayPal, Super Chat, send an e-transfer or check in the mail, all those links are down below. My email is on the Facebook group, which if you haven't joined already, that's how we're looking, that's where I've gotten all the images we're looking at today. And a check or e-transfer, um, if they can contact me through my website. Um... <laughs> what is uh... Lolly says I have seen Michael giggle quite a few times at his own artwork the Picasso acrobat and the little harlequin's face I remember that and he loved it so much <laughs> Barbara says Michael's giggles have kept us all going Interesting. So Lolly's talking about doing a Halloween version of uh, the American Gothic, the, the the piece we were just looking at. Is, is that the painting you're thinking? That would be kind of cool. I mean, certainly, you know, um, let's, in fact, you know, um, American Gothic has been um, used many times, you know, we've got Kermit the Frog, you've got, um, Winnie the Pooh, Roger Rabbit, you've got Aladdin, um, Minions, Here's your, um, uh, what is it, The Nightmare Before Christmas? Ghosts? <laughs> I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So this is really one of, like, the most uh, memed or parodied artworks of all time. Uh, there's just so many different ways, different, I mean, you can throw anything in here and, and make it work, right?
Hmm. Uh, Lolly says, they stole my idea. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, where should we... Let's kind of, I think I was going to start at the bottom down here. Now, I have split the... Um, drawings and paintings into two separate groups. And so some people submitted drawings and paintings, so you're, you'll see your work um, in, uh, in both sections of this, of this uh, next little bit here. Okay. Okay, so saying, I was just reading some of these comments there. Senga says, I have done many drawings and paintings over the past few months, but now I'm going to start the painting classes. Awesome. So we're going to start here. We're going to work our way from Z to A in drawings. So I apologize to all of those of you named Albert or Alphonse or um, Addy or Addison. We'll get to you shortly, but you'll be at the end of the list. Because uh, you're usually the first one. So today you're at the end. Okay, so here we're looking at Yvonne has sent in some works. Yvonne is doing the drawing course. And so we got four drawings from Yvonne. Uh, this is great. I love this uh, nude figure. I mean, it's obviously a very exaggerated um, waist, or what's the op um, opposite of exaggerated? Uh, um, a, ver a, a ridiculously small waist. Uh, I'm generally, you know, encouraging artists to try to f use more. Um, um, uh, realistic human proportions when drawing the female figure, but that's um, that's great. So here we're learning about perspective. That's good. We did this drawing as part, of, and then this is a drawing we did afterwards, also working on perspective. I wonder if you can see. What about this drawing is not obeying the basic rules of perspective that we talked about in this particular class? You'll notice that all of the diagonal lines should be receding to one point, which you've got right here. All right, so all of those diagonal lines, for the most part, let's say on the table, the bed, the 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 paintings on the walls are all receding towards that point. You've done a great job of that. But you'll notice that the floor, these lines are all going in a diagonal to the right, and they're all running parallel. So ideally, these floorboards should also be pointing towards the vanishing point. Not a big deal. In fact, stylistically, I think that actually works kind of cool. It's kind of neat. And I could see, you know, you transforming something like this into like a really neat album cover or something. But just in terms of, you know, this we did this exercise part of learning about perspective. I think you might want to maybe just think about that. Because the main thing I wanted people to get out of these lessons on perspective was just being able to start to see perspective. To start being able to kind of look at... Um, uh, the world around you and start to see how those lines, the, uh, the diagonals receding to a certain point. Uh, Barbara says, it's coming up to midnight, so I'll watch the rest of the show tomorrow night. Uh, good night, everyone. Congratulations on all the amazing work. Good night, Barbara. Great. Thank you so much for tuning in. 
Uh, Senga says, Michael, I must run... Uh, you must run an autopilot. Uh, I love seeing you so inspiring, giving up your time for feedback. That's so sweet of you. Um, Yvonne, that's great. This image, that's cool. These bags, it's like she's carrying these big money bags or something around. So there's something kind of funny about that in, in that you have this very kind of slender woman who's, you know, kind of, she, she does, she's not laboring holding these bags. She just seems to be sort of like she's walking down the catwalk, all right, with these gigantic bags of money. But one thing that adds to the lightness of, of these bags is that they're not outlined. The fact that they're just yellow on a kind of a yellowy brown background makes them kind of indistinct and gives them a kind of an air of lightness to them. So whereas if they had been outlined, they would appear darker, heavier, more solid. And then it would be kind of strange. You'd be like, well, how what, are those just bags stuffed with, I don't know, uh, uh, what is it, uh, cotton balls or something? Why, why are they these big bags, but she doesn't appear to be struggling in any way with those shapes? So it's a very interesting image that you've created here. I don't. One of the things I will say is because there were so many images, I was just dragging and dropping them into my computer, and this time I wasn't able to copy and paste all of the titles and the comments that everyone had about each one of these artworks. So you'll have to forgive me that um, basically I'm going to be looking at and talking about everyone's drawings and paintings going forward without the context and maybe some of the comments that you provided to kind of explain what was going on in them. So in some ways that's uh, unfortunate, but also it might give you a bit of an idea of how I might just uh, see this work cold without any of the you know, knowledge or context surrounding them. And so again, you might, if some of you when you're watching, you might be like, well, if he had read the blah, 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 he would know that I did this and that for this reason. I, I did read them all, but after looking at a thousand images, I can't remember what was what. And it's also, I guarantee you, some of these images are going to be uh, mislabeled to different people just because of there's so many of them. And I did notice a few times, like, ah, I accidentally put the wrong person's name on this image. And I tried to fix it, and I'm sure a few of them I was unable to fix. So my apologies in advance for the the mistakes that will arise here. So let's move on. And we've got artwork by Shelley. Let's just look at everything Shelley included here. Okay, great job, Shelly. I love these illustrations you've done based on family members. Really cool. These are really nice. Um, I also think it's taking quite the the um, uh, the leap into the unknown. It's taking a big risk to try drawing family members, people that you know very very well, because. I generally don't recommend people do this uh, when they're just starting out because uh, you know we become so familiar with our family and friends that when you try to draw them, if it doesn't look exactly like the photograph, doesn't capture that likeness in the way that you might expect, it can feel really disheartening and discouraging. So I generally say, you know, draw people from, you know, uh, department store catalogs or magazines of sports that you don't follow like you know I don't know anything about golf so it'd be great if I got a golf magazine because I there, wouldn't recognize anybody so if I didn't draw them exactly like that then they actually look like I could care less right versus if I went and got a magazine um, about something I am interested in or or have knowledge about whether that were like a celebrity magazine, 
I might just be like, ah, it doesn't look like Beyonce. It doesn't look like, I don't know, the so-and-so prime minister or president or whatever. Ah, so anyway, so I, I applaud your your courage to take that on. And so I, as far as I know, these, these look quite accurate, but, you know, may or may not be how you feel about your work. But I like how they turned out. I think this is a really nice drawing of a really fun little moment here of, you know, this, this appears to be sort of like uh, either son and father or son and grandfather here, you know, driving around for the first time. One thing you can see is some of the kind of the problems that can happen when we're working from a photograph is potentially some of these areas were so dark that we didn't have details in them or maybe they were cropped out entirely. So areas like this, which were probably, you know, there's a leg here, I'm assuming, for this little boy that sort of just disappears. And this area underneath the steering wheel console is kind of just this black shape. Same thing back here. It's the kind of thing that if you were drawing from life, if you were sitting in the seat drawing it, you would probably see those things and try to draw them and then shade or darken them afterwards, whereas the, those details may not be available to you in the photograph. So I always suggest, like, sometimes you got to draw it wrong to make it look right. So part of me feels like I kind of want to see a bit of the... Even if it's if it's just barely hinted at, uh, the, you know, the, the back of this chair somewhere in here you know or maybe that little boy's leg and maybe a little bit of this you know i don't know what it might be the you know what is usually here the radio dials or something on the right bottom right that what i would i would consider doing that just kind of going in and, and just putting a bit of that there or cropping the picture literally cutting this picture down like doing something like that perhaps because then we we we're not kind of looking at these areas on the sides that aren't defined i mean not a big deal it's that or what i would do is just take some charcoal and just turn this into solid black around those edges um i love this drawing yeah so this is grandpa and grandson i imagine right they're at the game <laughs> and the, that's great that's uh that's really good you've got a really good job of getting their likeness in here that's very tricky to pull off i really applaud you for taking that that uh uh that big risk here and i think you're just going to get better and better the more and more you do that's beautiful too. Oh, it's so sweet, the little guy there. That's nice. Again, these are all really, really strong, Shelly. Yeah, so it looks like you're working from photographs. You're using a grid to help you transfer that image. One thing you, you may want to consider doing is sort of what I do in class, which is use carbon paper to transfer an image. So a few different ways you could, so you can continue using the grid and draw it out by hand. And some people much prefer that. Some people think of that as a much more quote, authentic way of drawing uh, and to get your image onto a paper to start. I see personally, I have nothing, I don't uh, have any kind of hangups about tracing an image. So a few ways you could do this is you could use some tracing paper to trace this image and then put carbon paper under the tracing paper and trace those lines or just put carbon paper directly under this and just immediately start tracing this line, these lines onto a paper. It would save you a little bit of time. Having said that, you did a pretty good job with this drawing without having to resort to carbon paper and tracing. So kudos to you. The one thing that can happen is it looks like, you know, we see probably this line from your original grid 
which looks like you drew and then tried to erase, in which case we sometimes it creates a little indentation. Let me see. Creates a little indentation into the page, and sometimes you get what we see here, that little white line that appears there. And that can be kind of hard to kind of um, uh, make go away. Um, one thing I would say here is the, the, the mane of this horse and the grass are treated in basically the exact same way. Um, and what that does is it might create a little bit of confusion. Like now that we've seen the original image and then we're looking at this, it's like, oh yeah, it makes perfect sense. But I wonder if someone looked at this image on its own without having seen the original image, if there could possibly be a confusion as to like, what am I, what am I looking at here? Is that grass here and grass there? Because here this grass is all vertical and straight lines. And we see this, these are all straight lines, but they're diagonal. What I think would help is seeing these lines curve to help emphasize the curvature of the neck of, the, of that hair kind of coming up. And again, you might say, well, that's not what it looks like in the original. They're all very, those lines are straight in the photograph. And my answer would be like, yeah, so what? Right, sometimes you gotta like, bend that rule to make it look so people understand what's happening in the drawing so beyond that though everything else is done really really well like these ears that's fantastic man all of the, the way that you've done that those very small little hairs around the eyes excellent all over that's really really nice so great attention to detail. I suspect why this happened, the flowers, awesome. What I was saying about the hair, like look how effective that looks. Because what you're describing is uh, that hair kind of coming over the forehead and down, right? So it gives volume to the shape of that the horse's head there. I suspect why this looks kind of so flat is because in the original, this is all just a big, dark, black blob, right? It's it's in shadow, and so we don't really see any detail. So what you've tried to do is sort of just kind of, you know, you're imagining what kind of might fall into that area. But because you didn't have any, any source material to kind of help you uh, figure that out, you've just kind of done this straight line. So what I would see, I think it's just... The, I think these lines should curve. I think that would make a huge difference. I'm not saying you have to go back and redraw or anything, but just thinking about... I'm always a big believer when you're drawing is try to use your lines to sculpt the image, to emphasize that form, especially if you're doing like shading, is rather than just kind of shade in diagonals, is to shade and curve like you're sculpting into the page a little bit. Great job, Shelley. Um, I love this. Here's Charmé's portrait of Dolores, one of our members of the group here. That's excellent, Charmé. Wow. That is... <laughs> that's a great drawing. Really nice. And so again, here we see you know the 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 principles of impressionism in action where we have contrasting colors used to describe value so rather than just use black you know underneath the chin uh, around the eyes to describe darker areas we've got opposite of the skin tone we've got purple right and so purple and green you know, our opposite of brown and orange on the color wheel. So it just gives the image like a lot of vibrancy and color um, as opposed to just kind of because black can is such a powerful color that it can really kind of 
um, clamp down the 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 brightness of a color. Yeah, Senga, you're right. One, wow, awesome. One hundred percent says Lolly. Great job. That is so beautiful. Uh, let's look at these other drawings by Charmé. These are great. Wow. Really wonderful Charmé. This, you know, while since I see these images here, I think it might be worth looking at. So these images here um, are by the artist David Hockney. And we did a, a painting, I guess it was a while ago, but of David Hockney, two of his dogs laying on this little dog bed. David Hockney, I think, is he's got to be certainly in the top five greatest living artists. Uh, you know, he's probably in his 90s now. Uh, and uh, really one of the, one of the great... British artist certainly of probably the greatest British artist I would say of his generation uh, but one of the things he did he did this he used a, a camera obscure or no camera lucida I think which is like a, a a it's a drawing device that lets you sort of copy from nature like kind of trace the image which is projected onto a canvas and so he did this really fun exhibition. I think this was at the Royal Academy in London where he did portraits of all the security guards uh, at that exhibition. And really kind of fun way of involving those, um, that, those staff members who are generally you know, ignored by most people. And I love that he... Is uh, he used them as the central subject of his work? Oh, I just noticed I'm about to lose some. I'm gonna plug these cameras in one moment. Uh, so, Charmé, I would suggest you take a look at these portraits that David Hockney did. Um, let's just see. What was I think it was at the Royal Academy. Yeah, there's. A, I think it's a book. It's called Likeness: Recent Drawings by David Hockney. It also features quite prominently in this one of my favorite books of all time the secret knowledge by david hockney where okay he shows himself using that's the same sort of device, the camera, as you can see. Well, anyway. Oh, here we are. So there's these security guards. And he's also um, kind of mimicking the style of Ang, uh, who um, uh, was one of the great front. Did we do a, we did a, we must have done Ang painting, didn't we? So many are I have such a huge list of artists that I want to get to. Uh. Um, Lolly says, "Didn't you do an exhibition of draw of portraits you did using a pr projector, Michael? I remember a video like that from a yes, I did. <laughs> uh, I've done a few exhibitions like that using different devices for drawing. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway." 
Um, I appreciate you noticing that, Lolly. Great job, Charmé. I mean, I have nothing really, I think, to add to these. But, I mean, this is just, it, it blows my mind. And this should be uh, inspiration for anyone out there who's maybe just beginning the drawing course. This Charmé, I think, did the drawing course, you know, a couple of years ago. And you can see, like, you know, how effective she can em employ her skills now for portraiture. And so if those of you who are just starting out who are like, ah, it's not turning out as well as I want. Well, if you put in a little bit of time, you know, within a sh relatively short period of time, you can be doing drawings just like Charmé here. Okay, I think Senga, there you are. Okay, so, um, yeah, you have... I, yeah, you've always been there. I th I, for a second, I thought that you were going to leave, but no, you are still here. So, Senga, we've got a whole bunch of works by you to look at here. So, here's some of your drawings. Wow. Let's well, let's go through them all together. Yes. Uh, great. Wow. Excellent. Wow. Whoa. Look how these <laughs> nice and messy. <laughs> There's my little girl. I love it. Okay. So, um, these are great, Senga. So, we're, let's, let's go back. So, I think they're kind of roughly in the order of when you uploaded them. So, I imagine that's the order maybe that you made them potentially in although I think sometimes you upload it a bunch at a time so but anyway uh, it does show the progression here of your work and just like we were talking with Charmé like I mean what you're able to do now just gives you a bit of a clue like you're gonna be able to do things 10 times better in just a very short period of time I love this I love you drawing not just your hands but trying to draw like your fingerprints and the texture here that is cool what a neat drawing it's like these these kind of swirls around on your hands start to take on a kind of van gogh starry night quality that is really cool i, I like that drawing a lot that is really cool and wow, great. So this is Albrecht Dürer's Praying Hands. You'll see a number of people who've also, because we did this in our drawing course, who've done this, but you did an exceptional job here. <laughs> it's funny, when I was putting some of these episodes, like putting some of these images together, I'm like, did we do that in class? Did I show people how to, like, some of these are kind of a little bit advanced techniques, and I'm like, what was I I was, I must, I was I'm really pushing you guys pretty hard here. Um, but you ri rise to the occasion, which is so exciting. That's great. That should be really exciting to see that you're capable of doing stuff like that. So this is, again, this is all from our, our introductory drawing course, which if you haven't done that, you can, I mean, I, learning to draw hands is such a useful skill because so many people avoid drawing hands. You know, at the university I teach at, most of my students go out of their way to avoid drawing hands, but they love coming up with their own characters. So often, all of their characters always have, like, giant, uh, like, oven mitts on <laughs> or carrying shields and things just so they can go... They don't have to draw fingers. <laughs> um, great. I love this. Kind of just showing kind of the curving lines going around the form showing the volume beautiful look at these i like those rings ah that's what we're seeing on the in your palm cool nice beautiful love that you even drew the bones in there i think i remember doing that in the class just sort of doing a little i love how much you're paying attention great excellent you know one of the this this is definitely probably one of the more difficult ones to draw when we start drawing you know it's it's one thing to draw a hand you know straight on or the back of a hand 
It's another thing to draw a hand when fingers are kind of coming towards you or away from you, right? Because then what you have to do is use a technique called foreshortening, right? Which is sort of like in making something that's kind of closer look larger and something that's further away looking smaller, right? In the, in the sense that let's say, how can I do this? Where's that other hand? Right, so one hand, you can see how big my thumb is back here versus my thumb here. Oh, I can almost get them to line up. This is going to take me all afternoon. Oh, oh, there you go. Right, two thumbs. They are, in actuality, the same length, but one looks much bigger than the other because one is closer. So foreshortening is, is like an essential drawing skill. It is also takes some time to wrap your head around. And I always find like drawing fingernails when we're... Um, when we're drawing fingers coming towards you to be really the most difficult thing. And really it just comes down to just careful observation, like looking at your fingers and just trying to see like in which direction does that line go in order, because I think that's probably what's happening here. It's just kind of the, these fingernails, um, Maybe you've just in, kind of exaggerated them a little bit, but what it's doing is just sort of making those fingers twist maybe a little bit more than they need to. Um, excellent. These are pretty wild. These ones where you're using... That's great too. You know, I also really like how you photographed this. I like this zigzagging line and the red. It makes for a really interesting composition, photographic composition. Uh, but sorry, anyway, the these, this one, and this one, and this one. Uh, I don't know if this is like some sort of charcoal or graphite powder or something. Gra graphite sticks, all these smudging and erasing very effective I like that a lot like it's very subtle like it what does that remind me of it feels kind of like late at night the sun is kind of, or the sun is just set and it's you know that that um you know you're it you're, you can't quite see into the darkness this reminds me a lot of once I did a I made a short movie with some friends, and we had to get this <laughs> raft that we had built to the location the night before we started filming, and so we actually rode this raft down a pretty big river, and there were moments like this where we're sitting on the front of this raft, and like oh my goodness there's a big island we're heading right towards it which way do we go left or right ah we're about to run and grab. it's kind of like that that's what this room i mean i have a vivid memory of that that i'm projecting onto your work but i love these the softness in these works really well and it's a it's a major um stylistic uh um diversion from some of your other works which have you know let's just say with these fingers which are all lined based all right and so it's kind of neat to see you doing something that is is much more ambiguous that these like like for instance you haven't defined the hills with lines here and there they just sort of fade out really beautiful i like this image a lot that's really nice I mean, I wonder if you're going to color it or add, you know, um, watercolor. Or, or, well, watercolor would probably smudge all of that, wouldn't it? If you did spray it, you could spray it with a fixative or hairspray and then paint over top of it. Oh, it's charcoal, you said. That's with one pencil. Wow. That's quite wild. I like that. 
This is great too. I like how you drew this with the charcoal and then used your eraser to erase back in. That turned out really nice. Really cool. In fact, I kind of want to see you do a little bit more of these with these big beams of light shining down into the water. Potentially even with one of these beams not just going over the horizon, but coming right down, like what would be coming right down towards us, like right into the foreground. Like, so you could see a beam of light kind of go right between these clouds and just like come right into the front. That's one pencil. Hmm. Well done. Yeah, this feels like this person's walking into like a into a fog and they're just going to disappear around that corner forever. Great. These kayakers canoeing. The one thing is is that they are done at a slightly different perspective. So I love how the mountains are done. That's fantastic. But these canoeists or kayakers they look like we're taking a photograph from above rather than from the kind of side. So um, that's what we would, when we're talking about foreshortening with like their, your fingers, we would probably not see the entire canoe like that. We would, in fact, I, where are my little canoes? Gotta clean my studio. What a disaster. This is ridiculous. Okay. So I ordered these 3D printed canoes because I'm doing a, a graphic novel right now. And so about Tom Thompson, who was a Canadian artist who spent a lot of time canoeing and stuff. So if I look at, let's bring your artwork up here. So you can see how like your painting right now sort of looks like we're looking at these canoes from above. When in actuality, we should be probably seeing that canoe probably like that. So you can see how we only see this very small amount of the inside of the canoe, rather than it being kind of like this, uh, what kind of shape is that? Like an almond shape or something? We're seeing this, uh, something more like that. Does that make sense? So I would just consider um, perhaps, I mean, it wouldn't be too hard of, to fix that, but, you know, just, uh, trying to get that proportion correct. Wow, these are great. Love that. Love these palm trees and the moonlight. Ooh, is that the moon and the clouds? I like that. Oh, I like I like this glowing. In fact, I think we could we could make this look even more uh, bright that moon by darkening the clouds in the sky, because the darker the area around that highlight gets, the more the highlight's going to appear brighter. It's like the same sort. Of, I always think of like um, like think about like a, a stage. Right. If you have, you could have, if all the lights are on, you could have someone standing in the spotlight. But there could be twenty other people doing other things on the stage, and if you're in the audience, you're just like, I don't know who I'm supposed to look at. If you turn all the lights off in the auditorium, but keep the one spotlight on, well, boom! Now we know who we're supposed to look at, and now that spotlight appears so bright, even though we haven't touched it, we've just turned all the other ones off 
right? So it's the same sort of thing. If we darken the area around this moon, it's going to make that moon look much brighter without even darkening the moon or lightening the moon at all. That's great. Yeah, so I, I was I was going to try to film something with my daughter to, to, so it could be a part of today's episode today, but she's off at school and um, growing up too fast, just uh, four and a half almost. Oh my goodness. Oh, when when I filmed that episode, how old would she have been? Twenty twenty. She would have been what seven months old or something when I did that. Um, great. Oh, that is nice too. Oh, that's the same image. Right? Is that the same image as... No. Is it? No. But it's the same composition. Oh, interesting. I, I mean, because... Or same... The way that you've organized the space is similar, because we've got... Um, that little island in the middle, and, it, like, water seems to be going around both sides very different i mean so that's super interesting to see those these two different images and how you've approached them in different ways this one is much lighter and softer and more ambiguous and this one's much bolder and maybe more ominous especially with these kind of big trees in the dark dark sky lends it, you know, a feeling of being kind of enclosed. Uh, yeah, wild. I like that. Cool. Great job. Wow, Senga, you're doing awesome stuff. Can't wait to see the other things that you've done recently. If you upload those to the Moodle, uh, or not Moodle, to the um, Facebook group will will continue to follow your adventure, your creative journey. Very exciting. Okay, so let's move forward here uh, to Scotes, Michael Scotes. Um, this is, I think we've just got the one of yours here. These flowers, it's like oil pastel. Great. What I, what's really neat is you can see the dimension here with these flower petals in the foreground. Um, and so they're eclipsing a little bit of the flowers in the background. I think that that's working really well. It creates a lot of dimension there. And the fact that they're also outlined, they've got a little bit of black in them is also pulling them forward. And we can see how when that's not happening with the flower in behind, how there could be a little confusion here. So if we outlined, let's say a few of these petals with a darker, warmer red, it's gonna make those flower petals that are closer to us seem closer to us because the, of the way they're drawn, just like what you've done here. So looking at this shows you you know, how successful that type of approach could be. And I encourage you to try maybe employ it here. And we could even do some of the, like, let's say this flower petal right up here, if that was also darker, it would make it appear like it's coming towards us. Um, and here's Sanju. Huh. Awesome. So we've got mostly Sanju. I think we've got your paintings to look at, and some some photographs of your students as well. Um, and hopefully these are your drawings, because as I said, I might have made a mistake and accidentally put your name on some stuff that's not yours. So I hope these are yours. Um, uh, that looks really cool. I mean, is the face a little bit distorted from the original? A little bit. But I also think they turn out really well. 
I mean, she looks tough. Wow, that's great. Um, I mean, I think maybe some of the distortion that we're seeing here in terms of her figure might be just from, like, the, the grid not being um, actually square. Like, it looks like these uh, um, rows are not... You know, they're shorter versus the columns are wider. So what that appears to have done is sort of stretched her body out lengthwise a little bit. But, I mean, you, you're, you'll see that there's some other people who had a little bit more difficulty with this particular um, exercise. Roberto, wow, look at these, Roberto. I love those penguins. And this uh, interior from our... Um, perspective lesson so you can see there's your vanishing point it looks like you drew a room in your own house that turned out awesome I love that you actually used your own space to practice drawing perspective in really well done because even just this little stuff this room off to the side learning how to do that that's a big step Big step, doing this table there. I think the one little thing where it looks like you may have got a little confused is just this line. Remember that line, this diagonal should also converge to where this point is. So I think we, that line might start there and end out here. But pff, great job. Way to go, Roberto. Senga says, thank you, Michael, for your feedback. I can't wait to learn more. Can I use hairspray to stop the charcoal from fading? What do you think? Should I do with pencil small landscapes? Should I add paint? Uh, good question. So, yes, you can use hairspray to stop the charcoal from smudging and from falling off the page like this. Um, when you're saying it fading, I don't, I don't, it's probably didn't fade. It's just that the charcoal has fallen off or smudged. And so we don't see those same dark um, areas as much. And maybe it started to kind of blur, especially if you close the book and those pages kind of rub together. It's going to kind of soften that drawing. So yeah, you could use hairspray. Hairspray is the cheapest and most accessible material. Uh, but you could also use um, what's called a fixative spray. So you can see here's like they've got like these workable fixatives, and so they're kind of like hairspray. But the thing is, is that hairspray is not intended for to use when you're making art, and so potentially over time that hairspray could turn yellow. It might have oils in it, which could start to kind of stain the image and maybe potentially even ruin it over time. If you're just practicing, using hairspray is totally fine, no problem. But if it's something that you really care a lot about that you are afraid might get ruined um, or that you want to sell to someone, you'd probably want to invest in something like this, like a workable uh, fixative like this. Right, so you can get a workable fixative. What workable fixative means is that you could spray that on and it'll, it'll trap all of the pigment and glue it onto the page. And then you could draw over top of it after it dries. There's also um, sprays that, like a varnish that you would spray that, that would be sort of the final coat and are not intended for you to draw or paint over afterwards. So with a workable fixative, you could spray it and then paint acrylic or watercolor over top of it too. Um, but yeah, I would suggest if you're going to do a lot of charcoal, this might be one of your best friends. The one thing is, is that these, um, the, they smell terrible. So you'd want to, if you want to spray this onto your drawing, you want to do that outside and you want to let your sketchbook stay outside for an hour. Uh, because if you spray that inside, or spray it outside and bring your sketchbook inside right away, your 
family or friends or teachers are not going to be happy with you because it has a, it's a really intense it's a terrible smell um so i'm um, one of these days they're probably going to make something like this that doesn't have quite the, the same terrible smell so i'm just warning you that if you spray that around your house you're going to upset a few people <laughs> um yeah, I love that you're saying I like to explore with different mediums. Great. Okay, we've got a drawing here by Richard. So mostly, I think this is Richard. Is this what one of yours? I think mostly Richard, we've been looking at your, your paintings. Are these yours, Richard? I have a terrible feeling that these aren't your drawings. It's possible, but as I said, when I was collecting all these images together... Anyway, I mean, I like these, but I have a feeling, Richard, you do, you would uh, maybe do these a little bit differently. Oh man, that makes me sad that I might have got that wrong. Um, so let's go down here to Reem, Reem Ali, who's also doing the drawing course. We got lots of artworks here by Reem, so let's just kind of scroll through them all. Great. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Great. Huh. Wow. Wow, okay. Goodness, it's hard to even know where to begin here. These are gray ream. Um, wow, okay, so where are we going to go? Now, how am I doing with time here? Okay, I still have. Another two hours that I could devote to this, but time is flying. Okay, so... Uh, I mean, I think you did a fantastic job. These are all great. Um, so I'm I, I'm not going to go through and talk about each individual one. I'm going to just maybe sit here and, and see if I, there I find, you know, either... Something but I, I think is exceptional about a drawing or something where I, an area where we could improve on really is basically what I'm going to think about as I'm looking through all your work here. These are great, great, great. Actually, you know, I, this is not necessarily the, the face of a giraffe, but, um, but it's actually a really cool innovation. Um, so that's, this is like, you know, the kind of cartooning where you might draw something wrong, totally different than the way it actually is, but it somehow seems just right. Wonderful. Look at these. Great job. Love this. I love these little hearts that you drew. That's fantastic. Lovely. I love you're using color, overlapping that color. I think what we can see here is maybe these might be a little bit less expensive colored pencils. And this might be an example of what happens when you try to layer less ex less expensive colors over top of one another. You can see how it starts to kind of get a little bit grainy. And the, as the wax resists um, other layers of, of pencil... So whereas if we had more expensive colored pencils, we'd be able to kind of get a little bit more nuanced look. And it's not a big deal, but it's one of those things, if, you're, if you really like using color, colored pencils, then and you're, and you're thinking of overlapping different colors like you're doing here, that's where more expensive colored pencils really shine. 
and where less expensive pencils kind of start to fall down. If you're just drawing colors separate side by side, you will almost not notice no difference at all. But when you try to layer those colors where you see the difference, these are exceptional. Great job, Reem. This is also wonderful. I love, again, that you did this based on your own space, I'm assuming. Now, I, I think I see the same sort of problem we talked about a little bit earlier with the lines on the floor. Here, again, the the vanishing point... Like, where is your vanishing point? Kind of somewhere up here, I assume, right? So all those... I'm not sure. It looks like we might have a few different... So I think your vanishing point it must be up something like here. So all those, well, it doesn't seem to be consistent, That's, which is not a major problem. I mean, there's lots of artists, if we start to really try to find the vanishing point, it ends up not being a point, but more of like a zone, a vanishing zone. Um, but I think where... I think part of the problem is is just these lines on the floor. All those lines on the floor, the tiles, should also be receding, pointing towards our vanishing point, or converging towards the vanishing point. Otherwise, it looks great. I'm, it's just uh, something to kind of notice. Um, so whenever you're doing a, a, a drawing that involves perspective, you're just looking at all the diagonals around and re remembering that they're all going to vanish towards the same point. Assuming we're doing one point perspective, obviously, right? That's great. That's awesome. That's really good. That's maybe one of my favorite things I've seen from you so far. That's great. I was looking at, when I was putting these together last night, I was like, Man, I really over-exaggerated the curve of that spine, and everyone has, like, this real gym, gymnast kind of figure. <laughs> that is definitely... I mean, that's what I did myself. Um, so everyone ob obviously all, all copied me, but then I was like, hmm, maybe it shouldn't have been quite so um, curved. But it gets the idea that the spine is a curved, and it's not just a straight you know, stick in one's back, but it's very funny to me personally. Excellent. I love this Superman. Huge chest and these giant muscles, but also relatively thin too, which is kind of funny. His face is awesome. This is like, I, you know, again, some people might look at this and, and not... Um, not appreciate this style. I do, though. I could see this being like you creating a whole universe of cartoon characters drawn in this exact way. And that's, I always think like sometimes people look at their drawings and they're, they're really unhappy with them. And then I look at them and think like, wow, there's a whole, you know, multi-billion dollar franchise right there. If you were just to run with it and develop it, you would you have like a you know a whole Marvel universe type of thing just waiting to be tapped into. It might not be what you 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 thought it would be, but it doesn't mean it's there's something wrong with it. It's just something different, right? Great, Doctor Seuss, excellent. That pencil is fantastic. I think we may even want to exaggerate some of the shadows or darken the shadows in a bit. These are great. These flowers, interesting how these the texture of these uh, lines you've put on them are. Huh. Those eyes, very nicely drawn eyes with those reflections. Excellent. Also, I liked how you folded the paper to help you give you a little bit more consistent squares. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfectly uh, folded or perfectly measured squares. Um, but really well, nicely done drawing. Great. Wow. Did, did, I, did we do this in class? Did I show you how to do that? Or did you do that? I, I've, I cannot have no recollection of what I actually showed people how to do. 
So that's pretty wild. Did I do that? Wow. Ah, there's Shelly saying hi. Hi, Shelly. We were just looking at your your drawings a little bit earlier. Amazing stuff. You should be so proud of yourself. Great job. Nice to see you there in the chat. Um, wow. This is cool. Was this? Were we talking about Julian Opie when we did that? Because it does look a lot like the artist Julian Opie's work, right? Did we? We must. Have, we, We must it must be one of these images we were drawing from, right? Great, excellent. I remember, sh you know, these drawings. I, they're really. I think we were talking about the block in method or the envelope method when I from these. Uh, this, is, this is what these drawings are from that particular episode, and very strong work came out of that. So it's really exciting to see that some people really found that technique useful for drawing figures. And of course you can use it for drawing other things too, but you know, really exceptional. Great job, Reem. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. I'm just going to go a little bit faster here because we've got so many images. That's cool. Did you do this twice? Did I make you guys do this twice? I can't remember. Wow. Great. Excellent. Oh, Charlie Brown. Keith Herring. Wow. And again, I apologize. I don't know what this uh, image is, but this is, the, I think, the most recent one you put up on the, um, on the Facebook group. So, you know, if we just kind of go... I mean, again, I saw your comment. You said you just uploaded them at random. But, you know, if this is sort of where we were at one point, and then this is where we are... Um, that's where we are now. I mean, that's very, very exciting. I'm really, really proud of you, Reem. Great work. Just can't wait to see more of your stuff there on the Facebook group. Congratulations. Okay, so now let's look at Randy's drawings here. Um, same sort of thing. Randy's been doing the class. I love your the background. That grid is very cool. Great job with the hand. Ooh, these... Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Beautiful. What I really like about this drawing here is how the, the building is really well defined with all these dark outlines and the stairs. And then everything else is kind of ambiguous, like the sky, the know, clouds or hills are all kind of a little bit soft. And that just, uh, first of all, it, it makes one part of the picture kind of in focus and that f helps focus our attention on it, right? So... Really nice. Okay, that's is that the same image? Okay. Wow, what is that from? Is that your own image or is that that's great? Wow, great job, Randy. Oh, neat. Okay. One little thing just to keep in mind is that all of these doors, they're they should all be parallel to the side of the page here. So those vertical lines should be going straight up and down as opposed to diagonal. Um, very cool. Wow. Look at that, Randy. Very cool. That is not easy to do. All of these details in here. Great. Same sort of thing, just remember to try to keep those lines vertical. Right, those cranes probably should stay vertical, but that's a lot to manage. And the fact that you've been able to do all that is pretty darn cool. Well done. Uh, excellent as well. Ooh, great job with Van Gogh's bedroom. Love it. Yeah, so here's an example where 
all of the lines on the floor are receding towards the same vanishing point as the table and chair and bed. Excellent, excellent. And you know what's kind of cool is that this, because of maybe where you put your vanishing point, which is probably somewhere down here, um, what it does is it kind of gives us a different perspective in this room. It, it makes us feel maybe like we're, unlike Van Gogh, which I think he was probably sitting down in a chair drawing what he was seeing. And so we see a different point of view. We see, versus yours, you're, like you're standing up and you can see the top of the bed more clearly, top of the chair. Whereas Van Gogh, we see very little of the bed. We see mostly just the headboard and a little bit. So that just shows you that just by moving your horizon line up and down, we can show or hide more of the scenario. So we're seeing, you know, just, you know, like in Van Gogh's painting, research, the bed appears to be like this. In yours, the bed appears, we see much more of it. Excellent. Wow, love all those shingles and sh and um, on the, the roof and the wow, that's great! All that detail, coupled with all those branches, beautiful, great dog, lovely rooster. That is wild. I think with this rooster, what we need is still something a little bit darker, potentially underneath its. Uh, what do they call that? There's a little floppy thing under its chin there. I think we need just to maybe darken that. After all, it is probably like a dark red anyway. And that might help define the face from the rest of the feathers. And then perhaps we could also darken some of the feathers on the underside of the turkey too. Uh, potentially even darken some of these or we would darken this and leave this lighter so that we can because this is like the tail of the turkey so i think we want to highlight that a little bit great very cool so you got you know a lot of this painting really well done you know it's tricky using that grid and this is really probably the first time we did faces in that class so there's a little bit of distortion with like the lips and the eyes and stuff um and so, but using this technique for the, maybe the first time is a little bit tricky, but I also don't mind it like this. It definitely has almost a bit of a cubist quality to it. So Picasso would, would love this one. And here you've gridded out this image to create yours. Another great job. One thing I would say is again, if we look at Let's say you've done a really good job of getting the, the, the general shape of this figure in place. And notice how, like, in fact, let's just bring them both up to the same scale. So notice how we only see one eye here. And this nose is almost touching here. The face is generally looking away and pointing towards this direction. Versus yours... We've got two, the, the figure is looking directly straight ahead, right? And so we see two eyes and the nose is even pointing in this direction towards the left, right? So what we, I, if you want to get this a little bit closer to the original, is just noticing we've got one eye and this nose is pointing to the right in the opposite direction. Not a big deal, but if you're kind of like, what if I, why is this looking different than the original. But everything else you got very, very well done. Like your Spider-Man, that's great. Wow, these are all excellent. Great. Love this. <laughs> that's great. She's just kind of got this look on her face like, She's, she's kind of standing here like, how much longer do I have to stand here like this? <laughs> that's great. 
Okay, let's move on here. This is Rahul. Awesome drawing of Albert Einstein. Love it. <laughs> Very cool. I like that. I like how you've used the blending uh, method to kind of get these soft areas on the face, around the eyes, the nose. Even, even in the hair, really well done. Very funny. Um, I see in the chat, James says, I'm new to drawing. Which videos of him do you recommend for absolute beginners? Well, I think you could watch the entire uh, free drawing course I did here on YouTube. Almost all of the images we're looking at right now are from that course. And if you go watch the video, I mean, you'll see that it's got like, I don't know, 500,000 views and the comments are all very positive. So if you're, if you, as you say, you're um, an absolute beginner, you'll probably really like starting literally at the very beginning of that course. The link to the drawing course is down there below, but let me see if I can find it for you anyway and put it in the chat. So that uh, you have it there, James. So I would love to see you do some of those drawings, take photographs of them and upload them to the, the Facebook group, join the Facebook group, just like all these people have, and then join us for the next feedback episode so that we can celebrate your drawings. Because I think you'll, you'll see that it's uh, probably a lot easier than you expected to just get started, so. <laughs> um, excellent. Okay, I'm going to move forward here. Uh, or where, where are we at? Okay. Perla is our next artist. We've got lots of works here by Perla. So... And I think these are probably all a little bit out of order, too. So here we got... I like how you do, do you photograph this in steps. And I like how... So you, you did this perspective drawing from our draw, drawing course. And so you, you've got your vanishing point. You sketched it in. And then you used a pen to go over top of your pencil lines. And then maybe even erase all of the, the pencil lines afterwards. Really nice job. Very cool. Here's another one, a two-point perspective. I don't even know if we did a two-point perspective drawing. And I, and so here, it looks like you're really challenging yourself, Perla, to see if you can pull it off. Excellent. Great. Wow. Beautiful. That turned out really nice. Wow, not easy to do. I think this is when you started and then abandoned. Um, I think it was going, looking like it was going in a great direction. I, I think maybe there's still something there. Wow. <laughs> the bug? Are you kidding me? That was great. And this dog? Wow. Look at the fur that you've drawn. Perla, great. Wow, and these, oh my, Keith Herring images. Shelly says, I started with drawing, but went, uh, and paint, drawing with painting, but went back to drawing. I'm now on episode 27, and I think they're great. <laughs> Thanks, Shelly. Wow, that's great. Look at that. It's neat to see, you know, the, how the drawing, uh, you know, unfolded and how changes you made along the way. These stylistic ones. Coffee keeps the grumpy, coffee a day keeps the grumpy away. <laughs> I haven't heard that before, but it sounds, sounds about right. 
That's cool. Look at that cat. It's also kind of like, what is its eyes doing? It's like, its eyes almost closed. <laughs> uh, great. I mean, one thing is, is maybe the mug, this, the, the, um, the handle of the mug is a slightly awkward. You know, but I also, again, sometimes those things, you know, may be technically wrong, but they can also have a lot of personality and become like stylistically really attractive. And I, I, as I've probably said many times, like, uh, I, f I think our style comes out in our mistakes. And some, so it's like often we deny our style that which is it's all it's a lot i think of style also a lot like personality and you know sometimes we try to suppress our personality to fit in and eventually it's sort of like when you're just like you know what screw it i'm just gonna be who i want to be and and then all of a sudden your personality starts to blossom and it's sort of like in drawing the same sort of way Okay, cool. Oh, maybe some of those drawings that I attributed to Sanju might have been perlous now that I look at it. Yeah, I think that's what happened here. Huh. Wow. Awesome. I love these fingers tearing through the drawing. Great. That is really neat. Love it. Yeah, more, more, more. Great. Look at this. Perla. Well done. I love this doggy with the, the hat on. Oh, wow. Yes, yes. That is funny. A chihuahua with a mustache just like I have. That is hilarious. I think, you know, this mustache just needs to be darkened. I think that would be really helpful because right now it's a little bit ambiguous, but I think if it doesn't have to be necessarily as dark as these eyes, but darker, I think, and then that would look really cool. Wow. My goodness, what are we looking at? Is this like a Lies Ramen shop? Um, is this a drawing based on something you saw or from a photograph or something? Because this is awesome. Are there potentially some problems with the perspective? Yeah, maybe. I mean, the, 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 uh, this is not lining up with the sidewalk. So one wonders, is that the way it, it was built? Or is that a quote unquote mistake? I don't know, but I really like it. <laughs> um, okay, let's move on. Nicholas, we just have the one drawing here of a cat by you. I love this. Really neat, Nicholas. Great job. Huh. I like the, these kind of greenish yellow eyes. Compliments it really well. One thing I would say is this tail. Um, what I would say is probably the tail, like we might have a line, like the from the hind part of the body would be probably maybe broken up here. Because otherwise it looks like that tail it maybe is like growing out of its belly or something and wrapping around underneath the knee. Not a big deal. I mean, very small thing. Probably nobody else notices. But I think just defining that so that, that tail looks like it's coming out of the back of the animal, not from the underside or, from, or just growing out of the leg or something. Otherwise, exceptional. Great job, Nicholas. Okay, Mariana. Okay, we got some work from you as well. So let's take a look at this. We've got hand. Ooh. Ooh, excellent. Huh. So, uh, wow, okay, where, where, okay. 
These are pretty wild, Mariana. Um, I love this hand. Exceptionally well done. This is pretty crazy. These, I like how you've... See, this is really wild where you've got... It looks like maybe you did a watercolor. I think that's watercolor. And then afterwards you drew over top of it with like a very thin black pen or marker. Um, it is... A, okay, so one of the things I talk about often in the, in the painting classes is how black... Like, okay, so if you think of a painting like a window, or drawing like a window, black, and it's the darkest black, is going to appear closest to, to the window itself, like a bug or a spider crawling on the window. Everything else is going to appear further away. So when you use black, you, you want to be careful how much you use and where you use it. So ideally, black is only in the things closest to the viewer. Um, now, doesn't always artists don't always follow that um, recommendation. Comic book artists often use black everywhere, right? They outline everything, and so this is a little bit more of like the the way that a comic book artist might illustrate this scene in which we have black in the sky and in the water and in this um, built or lake or not lake uh, island in the middle or to, off to the left middle of this artwork stylistically I think it's kind of neat it does bring it into the cartoon comic kind of realm when we have all that black squiggles all over the place because also black is often used to outline uh, cartoons and comics. I mean, I don't think you, I don't, you don't, certainly don't need black anywhere in this painting. What it does is it makes the sky look like there's a lot more movement in there than maybe there actually was. I don't know. It's just something, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, now that I look at this, like, that is wild. Very strange. Psychedelic. Bizarre. Ooh, it's, like, kind of a little bit scary, these figures. I don't, I don't know what I'm looking at here. <laughs> I mean, um... I don't know. A very kind of ghostly, phantasmoric. No, what's the word? Fanta. Okay, I gotta look this up. Phantasm. Fant. Phantasmagoric. Phantasmagoric. Yeah. Wild. Very wild. And then look at these. What is going on? Is that a little brain with f attached to some feet? And a flying saucer being flown by an ear chained to a mouth. Wild. <laughs> Marianne, these are great. And then look at this. We've got a butterfly with human ears for wings under the ocean. A, a whale with a lighthouse on its back with a bucket of eyes. And, a, and an octopus in a moldy bathtub. Have I, have I got it all? Oh, and a hand crawling out of a seashell. A pirate ship. A and then maybe these are hearts. Maybe human hearts. It's like a coral reef made of human hearts. A lot of awesome stuff here. Oh, and this looks like a snake turning into seaweed. So bananas to slip on. I mean, that's pretty wild. A lot of cool stuff going on in this image. I really like how imaginative your work is. And you know what's interesting is this... 
looks like the caterpillar from... Was there a caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland? Was there? I think so. So it's interesting. I mean, that's where I'm... I mean, that's, I think, that's... Yeah, let's just double check. Yeah. Okay. So it is very interesting to me to see that, you know, you're doing a drawing of a caterpillar from Alice in Wonderland... And then the images you create, maybe of your own, are also very surreal and strange. I love that you're really kind of going wild with your imagination here. I think you just keep on doing more. I'd like to see this develop. Like, how are you going to paint this? And, you know, what's it going to look like? And whose work does that remind me of? Is it, um, so I love this artist. Jim Woodring is, I think, one of the great comic artists of our time. His comics are very strange, very weird, certainly not Superman or Batman. They're, they're very surreal and abstract. Many of them don't even have word balloons, and they feature these, like, characters that are, you know, wandering around these bizarre landscapes. And um, So you may, you may really like... This is pr probably his most famous one, Frank, is what this, this main character is from. Highly recommended. I mean, some some people watching it are just gonna fall in love with Jim Woodring, and and his, and some people are like, these are insane. <laughs> I have so I, I just I always find it fun to kind of introduce work to different people so that they can kind of judge for themselves. And I think it's you're, it's totally fine to like some art that other people dislike, and it's totally fine to dislike art that other people like. Right? We don't all have to agree on the same things. Some people like different food than other people do. Hey, that's the good thing about being alive, is we can all make up our own uh, sense of taste. Okay, so let's move on here to Leslie. Um, and we've got... Leslie's also had started the course. Excellent. Great. Great. Well done. You know, one thing I would say, Leslie, is you could use... It looks like a lot of these drawings are condensed onto one page. I think you should ex fill, expand to, you know, like do this drawing of a dog on a full-sized piece of paper. Don't worry about saving paper for your drawings. Right? I mean, it's... I think the one thing about... Often people will draw smaller because when we draw smaller... It can make, can sometimes make an average drawing look better because it can kind of hide any problems because they're so small they just disappear. Whereas if you do draw bigger, it can often reveal some of the problems in the drawing. And I can hear people saying, why on earth would I want to reveal all of the problems, all the mistakes and errors in, in a drawing? I That doesn't sound good at all. I... But I think the one way that we learn is you have to be able to see the problems in order to be able to fix them. So the more, the larger you draw, the more those problems become evident. And then I, the more that I can help you. But maybe even if you're able to be a little bit of objective, you can kind of stand back and you can see those problems clearly on your own. Um so and then I'm here to help you fix those problems right and so it's harder for me to help people when their drawings are a little bit smaller um, anyway very okay so oh those are just those ones here let's just quickly look back at Leslie your, your work again 
These look great. I mean, your sketchbook looks beautiful. I love how you've organized it. Um, but, you know, it's, and different people have very tidy, clean sketchbooks. And some people, their sketchbooks are disaster zone. Or they're really, really messy, full of all sorts of things. So I would encourage you to potentially maybe get a little bit messier. And use make drawings that fill up more space in your sketchbook. Okay, so Kejol, Kejol, Kejol. Uh, we're going to look at your work now. He's got lots of stuff here. You got these, uh, this butterfly drawn based on a photograph. So it's interesting, you know, we have this photograph that's taken with a very blurry background. And then you've, uh, you're trying to draw this drawing. What I, and I think it's, it's a good challenge. The one thing is, is then you've sort of brought some of these leaves back into focus. So maybe like this stuff down here, that could have been omitted, I think. And we could have continued with, or it could it be much lighter? Because you see what's happened is by making it darker, it appears to kind of come forward. And if we look at the original, it's actually, it's, it's further, it's behind where the, the, uh, the butterfly is. So I think we want it to go even further backwards. So to do that, we would kind of want it to make it a little bit lighter, not so dark. Because the darker things are, as I said just five minutes ago, the closer it's going to come to the viewer. And the lighter things are, the more it's going to seem to drift backwards into space. So uh, yeah, I think you kind of want to just lighten it up. Now you, you don't have to get an eraser and redraw it. Just something to kind of put in, the, in your memory for, for next time. That I think we could have... Like, I like that some of this stuff in the background is kind of just getting a little bit fuzzy. I think that's kind of a nice uh, approach here. That is excellent. I think maybe the highlights on these, the apples and stuff, could be softer. So rather than outlining the highlight with a black, you could just sort of keep that as a as a lighter area. Because uh, the one thing, it, by outlining it, it, it might cause the confusion as to, is that a highlight or is that where, you know, um, a bug has made a hole into it. Maybe there's a worm that's pop gonna pop out of one of those little holes. <laughs> I like this uh Deborah just put in the chat. Rick's great aunt uh Ed Ed, Ed used to say if anyone liked the same thing there wouldn't be enough to go around. Very well said. That's very smart. I like that. Yeah, we, everybody needs to like different things so that we don't run out of that one thing that everybody loves. Okay, let's look at some more stuff by Kishol. Let's, get, let's actually flip through all these here. Wow, whoa, wow, whoa. <laughs> Great. Okay. So let's go back through here. Wow. Hmm. Okay. So it looks like these were in uh, some of the drawings that I did, sort of showing people how to draw directly from life. And I encourage people to kind of do little tiny sketches. And so that's what we see here. Awesome. Great, great, great. I love this drawing of these lamps on this wooden table. Beautiful. You know, the one thing I would say is, I think everything looks great. You know, these little dashes of uh, in the background here, I think are a little bit unnecessary. And they look a little bit like an afterthought. Like, you, like look how much attention you've spent drawing these, these oil lamps here. Right? I mean, clearly, this is what might have taken you half an hour, 45 minutes or something to do all those details. And so you spend all this time very carefully doing all of that. 
and then it appears at the last minute. It's like tap, 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 tap. You, you kind of finished all that in. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with having different speeds of mark making in a drawing. But one thing, though, is it it feels a little bit more of like an afterthought where you're just trying to get it done really quickly. And it's like, well, but then what about all this stuff that you clearly spent so long on? What if we treated the entire drawing with the same level of patience or speed, right? So if you like doing all these kind of dots, well, what if we tried drawing these lamps just as fast as you did these dashes in the background, right? Um, I think because, yeah, I feel like it's a little bit of an afterthought and it doesn't bother me so much, but... I think it, it, in other drawings it could. You kind of want to be careful about doing those last... Like some, Sometimes people, when they, they're working on a drawing, like, oh, I've been working on this for an hour. Oh, I just want to move on. And so they just kind of get lazy right at the end. And it's like, oh, uh, you know, it, it was going really well. Like, we don't, you know. So um, maybe just take a break rather than trying to finish it as quickly as possible. Excellent job, Pajol. Did all of these. Great. I love that you you drew this costume, the Shakti Man, over top of your um, eight head tall figure uh, sketch that we created. You created your superhero, Shakti Man. I love that. Excellent. Great. <laughs> oh, wow. That is awesome. I like how that turned out. Wow. And the thinker. These are excellent. My goodness. Okay. Just gonna stretch my legs out a little bit here. Hmm. Um. So we're okay. Let's uh, let's let's get this next set of drawings up here. How are we doing for time? What time is my meeting at? I think got parent teacher interviews tonight here. So I still got another hour. I don't know if we'll... Get... So we'll get through all the drawings in another hour. I don't know about all the rest of the painting, so... So where do we end off? We did uh, Z through K. Now we're doing J through A. Whew. In fact, let's... Uh, just so I... Let's just make it easier for me to do a little intertitle. Just a quick reminder to people watching to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, join our Facebook group, upload your artwork to the Facebook group. All the things we're talking about are things that people uploaded to the Facebook group. And so if you want to participate in this type of uh, feedback episode in the future, you can join the Facebook group and upload your work for free. Now, if you want to support the channel and help me pay the bills to keep the lights on and the streaming devices and the technology, the cameras, all that kind of stuff going, all the hard drives for all the storage of all of your images, please consider leaving a donation through PayPal, the Super Chat during the live stream, or send an e-transfer via email or check or, or money order, etc. 
thank you to everyone who's been so supportive over the years. Okay, so uh, Eula has done this drawing. I think there's a bunch of paintings that Eula's done as well, but uh, let's start out with this one drawing here. This is using the block in method, I think, from my drawing class, right? Uh, looks very good. So you can see, I think, or sorry, we've got the block in and we've also got the line of action here. It's nice to see them side by side. Um, so, and you can decide for yourself, each one of you, which method works best for you. Uh, you know, I'd say probably the majority of people like using the line of action. Uh, but there is a small minority of people who prefer to use the blocking method. And so I, I did separate episodes on each one of those, the, the major, most popular figure drawing techniques out there. And I think familiarizing yourself with them and experimenting with them would be hugely helpful. Because if you found it really difficult to use some of the more common methods, the blocking method might be a real eye-opener. It was for me anyway. And I, I've, I've noticed when I've taught... Uh, in-person classes, there's usually one or two people who find the blocking method is like a major breakthrough because they're just like, I, I just can't seem to draw people like everybody else can. Like, why does everyone else have such an easy time and I can't do it? Well, try this method, right? Okay, let's move on here to Joan. And we've got a bunch of images by Joan, so let's just kind of flip through them all here. <laughs> Excellent. Wow. Wow. Oh, great. <laughs> great. Okay, so let's go back here, Joan. Um, wow. I love this lion. The, the mane, all this hair. I think what we need is maybe a little bit of a shadow underneath this line on the ground. Maybe bring some of that grass in front of its paws. I mean, I know this is maybe just a sketch, but just thinking about shadows are really helpful at giving your drawing or the, the figure of the object in your drawing, it, like locating it in space. Because if a shadow is touching an object, like my finger on this table, we know my finger is is on the table, right? If my finger is not touching my shadow, we know my finger is above the table, right? So when your shadow is touching the object, then we the, the object is on that surface. So essentially what that tells me is if we don't have an object or shadow underneath, let's say, this, t this lion, it's makes it possible that maybe the lion is floating. Maybe it's an astronaut lion, right? As opposed to a lion that's walking on the grass that that shadow is going to give it weight, make it, you know, like it it's, uh, locates it in space. Oh, wow. Look at this leopard leaping out of the snow. I think that's what that is. I mean, I might consider having uh, some snow kind of flinging from its tail and maybe some uh, paw prints going back into the distance. Perhaps. <laughs> this is great. I like how you used the grid for this drawing. So we have this fellow holding a cat. Big cat. <laughs> That's great. Excellent. Wow, nice Batman. And what is he, what is Batman carrying there? Is that a banana? Or some sort of knife, a scythe or something? <laughs> I would like it to be a banana, because there's something funny about Batman walking around with a banana. I mean that's a it's a great drawing. Really well done. I like the layering of of that blue and black. Really well done. Excellent. Great dancer. Wow. Beautiful. You know what's interesting is that this woman appears a little bit older. Like her her hair looks like kind of a little bit gray. Huh. 
Heard some sounds outside. I mean, those are just fireworks. Wow. That is cool. Wow, I love this indigenous person dancing with the feathers. Really nice. <laughs> That's great. So we're using a grid here as well. What's with these? Yeah. Looks like there's a grid there. These white lines going across there. So I think, you know, you can use the grid all the time for every drawing you do. I think at some point you may want to consider, you know, uh, maybe even using the blocking method, using a different method for for sketching your figures out into into your images. That's really nice. I like this a lot. Hm. Really nice rabbit. Uh, done very softly. Like this reminds me of. Um, Like Albrecht Dürer, you know, I think I focused partly one episode, the, the hands that uh, we drew in uh, one of the drawing episodes was, was is by Albrecht Dürer, one of the great illustrators, drawers of all time, great painter as well, but I think his drawings are just incredible. So it's kind of neat seeing your rabbit and Albrecht Dürer's there's a lot of similarities here. And even this kind of composition is not too unlike stuff he would have done. Obviously yours is much softer and almost a little bit dreamlike. I like that there's very few, if any, outlines in this drawing. Everything is kind of a little bit fuzzy. It's a little bit kind of more of an impressionist approach to drawing. Um, so that's cool. These are great, Joan. And then here we got, uh, looks like Mick Jagger. I was thinking to myself this past week, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles both released new music in the same week. I mean, or maybe over the course of two weeks. <laughs> like, when was the last time that happened? Like 1969? Maybe 19... Because when did... Abbey Road, it came out in 1970, I think, right? Um, anyway, this is a great, nice portrait of uh, Mick Jagger. You got all the wrinkles in there. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing I would say is, you know, maybe his hair could be a little bit darker. Um, like, one thing, if this is based on a photograph, what I would usually do is, is just kind of squint my eyes like I'm pretending to sleep right and I look at the original and then mine side by side you kind of go back and forth and when you look at one you'll kind of see like the original you go like oh wow okay that needs to be much darker I didn't realize realize how much darker because when you squint your eyes the details go away and all you do is see the contrast between light and dark so and when we're drawing, generally, unless we're using colored pencils, that's really all we have is value, right? So that's, you know, there's a whole episode I did on, on shading, and um, shading is, is different techniques, different ways of, of modifying the value in a drawing, the contrast between light and dark. <laughs> that's wild. What are we looking at here? This fellow is on a sitting on a grave. 
with this disembodied head next to a tombstone, Lenore, and a crow or hawk appears to be swooping in right about to, with its talons, dig into this poor fellow's arm here. So that's a very mysterious illustration. I like it. I mean, is it? Is there maybe a, some slight awkward, pr you know, proportions with the body? Yeah, a little bit. You know, the the face is maybe a little bit too big for the body, and the legs are are too small for the body. So you know, it becomes like like a caricature in which the head is disproportionately larger than the rest of the body. So, you know, your legs account for half of your of your body. Right? So, these legs, if you if you stretch this leg out, it should be as tall as this entire form. Which you know it might be, but not just lengthwise, but just like the width we think we should have a little bit wider legs. I, th I would imagine that this leg would probably, in its current situation, kind of extend off out of the, the drawing. Not a big deal. I just... And I also don't mind things being out of proportion. As, as I said, like one of my favorite artists is uh, William Blake. And he's kind of famously kind of awkward figures. Right? That's one of the things that gives his work such charm is sort of how he just uh, kind of follows his own drummer and allows things to be a little bit strange or weird, awkward, and that becomes one of the great charms of his work. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like anything... Um, you do you make a mistake once it's a mistake you do it twice it's a pattern right and or it's a style right so you can do anything wrong but if you keep doing that wrong thing over and over then it becomes like you're creating establishing a pattern i mean somebody would say you do the the wrong thing over and over again is the definition of insanity or something, right? It's also maybe the definition of a style, I think. I mean, this is, I mean I've just, I've, I've just thought of that right now, but um, <laughs> I there is, you know, maybe that's what style is. is a form of insanity. I don't know. Anyway, let's just <laughs> move on. Uh, okay. How am I doing? Okay. Whoa, we still got a bunch of drawings. Okay, I love this. Looks maybe like a self-portrait, Joan. Love those glasses and your hair. I like how the glass, the frames are nice and dark. I would think that potentially even a little bit of inside your nostrils would get a little bit darker. And then maybe the line between your lips could be a little bit darker. Maybe even a bit of the top lip would be a little bit darker. Because remember, like, you know, even if you're looking right now, my bottom lip is getting most of the light, right? Because it sticks out, right? It's, you know, it's a, the shape is, you know, it's the light can hit it. Versus my top lip is pointing in towards my mouth. So it's necessarily going to be a little bit darker. Right? Maybe it gets a little bit of reflected light off my chin and my shirt or my the bottom lip as well. But for the most part, it should be darker than my bottom lip. So, I mean, I think the drawing looks fa fantastic as it is. Just something you got to think about, maybe. Great job with the hair as well. I think we might have a f just a few places in the hair where it also gets just a little bit darker. I mean, I, again, the only reason I'm saying that, like, I don't necessarily, I don't mind when a drawing isn't, doesn't have a lot of contrast, but you do have, you know, like, let's say this earring or the stitching on the shirt here 
or your eyes in the frames are all nice and have a lot of value contrasts and that's great i just think well you've certainly proven you can do that and you've got the courage to go a little bit darker what if we went a little bit darker in parts of your hair too oh, just consider it that is excellent uh barbara streisand did we do a barbara streisand drawing in that class um that's great if we did I think we did, didn't we? Um, that's cool. She looks great there. Okay, moving on here to Jeff. So Jeff sent in, I think, th four drawings and then one painting that we'll look at later on if we get a chance to get to the paintings today. <laughs> that is such a beautiful dog, Jeff. This is a great example of how using different mark making um, approaches for different textures or different elements within a drawing can really pay off. So here, what's I think what Jeff has done a great job of is you can see, let's say this grass is, is done with a kind of a little scribble, right? It's kind of all messy and scribbly versus the fur is all all done with a little bit slower lines and they're all going in one direction so you know you can think of it like a guitar like some people strum a guitar and go down and up with the the pick going like strumming down and then back up along the strings that creates one type of sound versus someone who just strums down takes their hand and strums down so there's no down and upstroke. So it's it's a cause creates a different sound. Same sort of thing in drawing. There's a difference between scribbling across versus drawing. You know, one mark just going the same direction, taking your hand off the page and coming back around. And so by doing that, we've got it creates distinct different uh, textures. And one looks like hair, and one looks, it doesn't maybe the, it doesn't really necessarily look like grass, but it's a clue in our, that just kind of a neuron fires in the viewer's brain is like, not hair, hair, not hair. Right, so really well done. The reflections in the eyes, these little spots of reflections on the nose really pays off. This sort of smudging in the hair back here also works really well. Really great job, Jeff. Good job. And here's your version of Albert Einstein. Great. Same sort of thing. We have some of these sort of smeared lines, blended lines, and then some like in the mustache those kind of scribbles are left kind of distinct lines. So it, it makes a difference. Uh, it, it makes a distinction between clothing and facial hair, right? Or hair or, or uh, head hair, <laughs> right? I think that's really nice. One little thing I would say here is that the reflection in the eyes is in slightly different places. Notice how this reflection is in the top right of the iris and this one is closer to the center now it's entirely possible that they that this is exactly the way they appeared in the photograph and that's fine and often people will do that they'll reproduce the photograph exactly but the thing is is we're more likely to accept a photograph and as like okay well it's just the way it looked in the photograph um, versus a drawing, people are like, well, there's something odd about that. So what I would suggest is that if you have reflections on the eyes, and I think you should always have reflections on the eyes, that they should be basically, let's just say for, for simplicity's sake, they should basically be the same shape and in the same location on both pupil and irises. So that that should be in the same kind of top right of that uh, circle because when it's not 
what it it tells it it creates this kind of slight confusion because why would one light be causing a reflection in this area and not reflecting into this eye in the same way is there a piece of cardboard or something right in the middle of the face that's blocking that light from causing that reflection is there another light coming from here but then why isn't it reflecting in that eye so it can also create the effect of making those eyes look like they're potentially pointing in different directions not a big deal and i think in this image it seems to work okay despite that but that would be a that would be a big thing that that often trips up most artists I, like i think magically it's it's kind of holding together in this image but i would suggest going forward for anybody else trying to get those reflections in the eyes basically like you could create each eye and stamp it onto the other one so that they basically look almost identical and i yeah let's keep it that i mean i could go into the nuances of that maybe i did in the drawing episode where i talked about eyes but that's great. Here's uh, David Bowie. Great job, Jeff. Let's just look in here. Really, again, nice job with the blending. And then, so on his face, you've got that soft blending, you know, smudging the pencil lines together. Not only helps create a nice distinction between his face but then, and also his hair, because his hair's done individual lines, right? Again, it's not a scribbly line. We see each one of those pencil marks go up, come back around. They're all done with great uh, deliberation and, and uh, spe specificity. But it also kind of, to me, the, the blurring on the face also reminds me a lot of, like he's, he's wearing a lot of makeup in this moment. And so that smearing, to me, helps also emphasize like makeupness of some kind i don't know why i guess maybe it suggests the smoothness of the skin and you know our skin is not that smooth it's got little pores and zits and you know bumps and scars and things all over its stubble like i've got right now and yet by smudging those lines it kind of it it's almost like a, a clue to a viewer that there's makeup on there. And it won't necessarily always be there, but in this specific instance, it really kind of fires off those um, clues in my mind. Very cool. Excellent drawing. Great job, Jeff. Here's another drawing Jeff did of Kurt Cobain, the musician Kurt Cobain. Wow, that's cool. It's kind of neat seeing you holding up your sketchbook and your hand underneath, so it gives us an idea of the scale of this drawing. So this is an example where those reflections are in basically the same place in the eye. But here it looks like you've you've also made the, that reflection just maybe a little bit smaller, which is sort of what I was that was what I was gonna say. Maybe I'm not gonna go further into details because sometimes the reflections. They're not going to be exactly the same just because maybe one eye is getting that light more directly than the other. So they're, they're going to be maybe in the same place, but maybe not as intense. I will say it does look like the eyes are pointing in slightly different directions. That's one of the things I struggle with the most when I'm doing portraits and is trying to get those eyes to line up so that they're pointing in the same direction. Having said that, not all of us have eyes that are always pointing in the same direction. Sometimes I look at photographs of myself and I see one eye is kind of going in a slightly different direction. I don't do it deliberately. It's just how my body works. So, I mean, maybe Kurt Cobain's eyes did that too. Uh, but really, really nice. Also, it's kind of cool to see how you're using maybe your eraser to come back in and erase part of the pencil lines away. So that we get that kind of look of the lighter blonde hairs that's kind of crossing over his face and over other hair. That is really cool. 
Yeah, lots of love there in the chat for your work there, Jeff. Lolly says that Bowie portrait is crazy good. And Shelly says, Jeff, excellent pictures. I really love the dog, but they are all gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, dog was pretty cool, wasn't it? Great. Okay, Gabriel. Um, we've got a bunch here from Gabriel. Let's take a look. Wow. I like this. You can, or we can do it. Just draw. <laughs> Great. Love that. Awesome. Kara Walker. I like this. It's funny, you know, I colored this in black, but you went in and drew a grid on there. I like that. That's kind of cool. Wow. Nice apples and oranges, pears. Beautiful. Ooh, wow. I like that you scribbled that in. Wow. And just use those dark values. I don't know if we did this in class, but that is really nice. And so again, here's the, here's a scribble technique for shading. And there's nothing wrong with using scribbles to draw, right? I think sometimes we think of scribbles as just a children's activity, but, you know, Rembrandt used scribbles all the time. And I don't know about you, but I think Rembrandt was pretty good, <laughs> right? So that's great. Nice job, Gabriel. Wow, nice. This is beautiful. Really nice use of of uh, perspective to try to get these the, the buildings um, to line up and kind of recede nicely into space. You know, and again here you've got your these uh, roof tiles that are also done in a kind of kind of cursive scribble almost. You can see you spend a little more time on the right, and then as you came over left, you're like, oh my goodness, there's a lot of a lot of shingles to draw. Oh my goodness, and then they start getting a little bit wonky as they go. But is that a problem? I don't know. It, again, it always just depends on what your own motivation for making an artwork is. If your motivation is to draw something that is um, trying to be photorealistic, well, then maybe you'd want to kind of make sure these are done a little bit more carefully. But if your goal is to be kind of more expressive um, and be take a little bit of creative license, then maybe you want to do it even more, a little bit wilder. Maybe it's not wild enough, right? Maybe it needs to be really unchained. So that's what I often do when I'm working on a drawing. I, I, I often will think to myself, like, who is this for? Is this for me? And is it if it's for me, is it just for my personal pleasure? Am I just having fun? Am I just killing time? Am I trying to teach myself something? Or is this for someone else? Is this a gift for someone? Is this a, an artwork I plan to sell or exhibit? In which case, I might have a very different sort of um, approach, right? And... Um, just sort of keeping that in mind, you know, before I start something kind of might give me more license to be a little bit more, you know, silly, creative, take some risks, experiment versus some, I might be much more inclined to, to aim, f um, for something a little bit more precise. Ooh, wow. What do we have here? Yikes. I like all of these characters in this tree. You got this uh, Keith Herring-like figure that's trapped there with skulls and dogs and hands. And then this fella, ooh, he's looking kind of creepy. Like a grave digger or something. Grave robber. You know, he's, I mean, because he's drawn differently than everybody else and he's much darker lurking around down here oh the tree's got a little face on it that's great <laughs> that's awesome wow what is that is that from the what um arthurian legend of the sword and the stone is that what that's from cool i like her her armor or chain mail that's really well done. Really cool. And all the stuff you've done down here, very time consuming. Coloring in and around all of that grass. 
you know, that's something easily, that's like 20, 30 minutes right there doing all that work. Very cool. Wow, nice trees, Gabriel. Love these. Excellent, excellent. How are, is this pencil? Th those are great. I like these a lot. Really, really nice. I like how you've kind of used the smudging of, I don't know if this is charcoal sticks or something, to emphasize kind of the, the, the body of those leaves but without having to get too specific there on drawing every single leaf. Ooh, great rabbit. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Goodness. Uh, that's great. I think this is this looks a lot like something I would have taught. Yeah, oh, that's funny. That's great. Wow. Gabriel, that's great. Nice. Wow, I wonder what this is based upon. If that's something nearby or what inspired you to do this. Great. Wow, love it. Nice eye. Excellent. Again, it looks like you're know, really embracing this scribbling approach in your drawings. Um might be something to really think about maybe that maybe you've already been doing a lot of thinking about it but it's turned out really well excellent i love that wow wow great great <laughs> these are excellent i like this a lot what is that from photograph or something I mean, what are these two figures doing? There's something kind of funny about this. The way that they're kind of standing kind of side by side. They both kind of have a little bit. They're kind of sketchy little figures. Don't don't they look like they're... <laughs> you know, they're just kind of like... You know, if you were... Uh, they're almost like little spies. It's sort of like you're walking over this bridge and you see some I'm going to take my phone out and take a picture of these people and then or of of that skyline and then the people who are following you are like um, oh he's walking again let's start walking and you turn around and they're like <laughs> just kind of stopped in line together like why are they walking single file like this on a big open bridge I think that's very funny Ooh, yeah that is um oh what's uh what's his name we're gonna do one of his pieces coming up soon um Anyway, I mean, this is Edward Munk, but the scribbles in the background are... Um, Think of Marsden Hartley, but it's not Marsden Hartley. It's uh, oh, it's going to drive me crazy now. Anyway, it's not a big deal. Um, but I love. You'll see eventually when we come around to that artist. Oh, cool, great. The toilet paper, I love that. Yeah, it's really interesting how you, like. Your style has that, you know, the line is very important. These kind of scribbly lines. These are great. That reminds me a lot of... Um, uh, 
Milton Glazer. You know, obviously his his most famous image is this poster of Bob Dylan. We actually used that image in our drawing class. Maybe that's what inspired you to do that, perhaps. Really nice. I like these figures. That could make a really nice t-shirt or even a tattoo of some kind. Great job, Gabriel. Wow. Cool. One thing I would suggest is, I mean, you got a lot of these straight line scribbles. What if some of these scribbles were more uh, curving or serpentine like scribbles? Right? So that more serpentine scribble is something we see in the work of um, Edward Monk. Well, he's doing exactly what you're doing there, but uh, where is... So you can see he's got a lot of these kind of straight up and down lines here, but then as we get into the hair, everything starts to kind of get a little, ooh, a little wobbly. I'm not, it's not the best example. Maybe this. Oh, what a gorgeous image. Oh my goodness. Hmm, I can't, f oh, here we go. Oh my goodness, look how beautiful that artwork is. Oh, anyone who just thinks Edward Monk is just about the scream, that's maybe his most popular, but just love these kind of sinuous, sensual lines curving and flowing like water. So beautiful. So maybe just thinking about because the, the human face doesn't have any straight lines on it anywhere, right? Everything is curving. There's nothing to say that you that you have to draw the face with curving lines and you couldn't make a whole career of drawing faces or organic things with straight lines. But you may want to consider trying to use a little bit more curving lines and just see if it works for you. If you don't, then just reject it, throw it out, pretend like it never happened. Great Sydney Opera House. Beautiful. Wow. Giovanni Gardini da Forli. I don't know what this is, but I like it a lot. Really well done. So it looks like we got pencil, maybe some watercolor and graphite. Really cool. It looks like you drew with pencil and then um, drew over top of it with pen, maybe erased your pencils, and then maybe put the smoke coming off there. I like that a lot. Is it number 49, or is that part of a series? Wow, nice, great start. Where's the rest of the face? Beautiful. Wow, look at that. So I think there's maybe just a little bit of, a, of distortion in the face. So we have like these eyes going straight across, but this mouth going on an angle. So if those eyes are going straight across, then the mouth should probably be parallel to it. But if on the other hand, we want to do the mouth, then these eyes should be parallel. So that other eye, if we want to bend it to meet this that other eye should be down here probably and that eye should be kind of tilted a little bit inward so just trying to keep those kinds of things those parallel the, the lines on the face parallel otherwise it's going to make it look like 
one side or that side uh, being pulled down or pulled up in other words beautiful wow now that is wild great cool look at that i don't know what's going on here but i love it all of these all of this line work is very very attractive Right. Take some time to do all of those lines and use that ruler and get it all to kind of line up nicely like that. Very nice. Great job on the thinker. It's nice use of that green for this image because, you know, this is this sculpture, which has been reproduced some, several times, has kind of um, oxidized and the bronze is, is kind of a little bit green on those ones that have been left outside. So using that green works kind of well. The one thing I would say is the other part of his body, like the way this is drawn is it's almost like his top torso is kind of twisting away because we don't see this other arm here. It's kind of hidden, but, and yet, so there's a little bit of a confusion. Like, why do we not see this part of his chest here or his other shoulder and maybe this is the way I drew it because I did show people how to draw it so it's possible there's an angle like that and I was just drawing what we saw but it seems like it's missing something that's beautiful excellent wow great <laughs> that's funny this is sort of like a Banksy image or something here the monkey spray painting its own face, its own self-portrait, but out of blood or something. <laughs> great, great, great. Ooh, that is, okay. Oh, so we're, okay, so we're a different artist now. Okay, so great job, Gabriel. Well done. Love this. Excellent, excellent stuff. So we'll move on to the Ds. Here's, uh, Daria, hope I'm saying that right, Daria. Cool, I love this drawing of this figure. That reminds me of an artist. Robert Longo. Uh, was a kind of very important, popular New York artist in the 80s. Uh, you'll even see some of his work in the background of in the movie American Psycho. <laughs> uh, so these he, he's very famous for this series of images of these people jumping, and then done in very painstakingly recreated in pencil. So there were photographs, and so this just reminds me of these sort of jumping like figures. Again, the scribbles just sort of exactly like Gabriel was doing. Wow, excellent. Look how dynamic that figure is, especially with that scribble. So let's say this arm, look how you've kind of scribbled that arm in. And so it makes it look like there's, ah, like, inst like, like a lot of movement there. And the fact that all of this is scribbled just makes it look like it's happening so fast that you can't have time to describe it all in, in detail. Excellent, 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 excellent. I think there might be a few things we could do to improve this dog, though. But I think in the video I talked about, you know, using lines to, to see where the legs are in relationship to one another. Excellent. So this is maybe a bit better proportion than I did. I remember I had a very kind of, um, what is it, kind of a cashew-like shape for the back. I really exaggerated this. Looks like you've kind of cr oh, like helped bring mine a little bit more in line with reality. Um, these arms still look a little bit short, I think. Yeah, it still feels like they could go a little bit longer, that wrist. Not a big deal. Excellent. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. 
Excellent. Wow. Love that. Is that the Kara Walker? I like that you actually drew a face right into that. Wow. Great. That ear. I wish more people did the ear episode because ears are hard to draw and people often just sort of ignore them. Um. Wow, that hair episode, great job. First hair attempt on Facebook, awesome. <laughs> that's great, that's great. I mean, that's that's my police sketch right there. <laughs> I like that a lot. That cracks me up. That's very funny. Well, so, okay. I mean, a few things are, is that these eyes are a little bit too high on the face, right? They Ideally, the eyes should be roughly in the middle of the face. And so they are higher, which means that everything else up here is getting crunched up into the top of the head. So right now, it's like I don't have... You know, if the hair, it looks sort of like the hair is just growing right out of the top of my head, right? So we've kind of omitted this whole part of the head, right? One quarter of my head has been chopped off. So it makes me look like I'm missing the top quarter of my head, right? And everything's sloping in here. So we have, you've drawn this little bit of hair. But all of this other stuff, you've kind of also chopped off. So we need this to be rounder and taller. Um, I don't mind. I mean, it's. I think it's funny, but it's, again, anatomically not quite correct. Um, this portrait of um, uh, Barbara Streisand. Same sort of thing, like, you know, the Burr... You know, I think everything would look fine if we were to do this, right? That is all fine. The problem is is with her jawline, and maybe her chin could come out a little bit further. And her jaw wouldn't come out so much like that. It's going to kind of go, you know, in this direction. So... It's gone an extra, what, 30% grade higher than it should be. Which is making her face look really narrow. All right, so if we look in this direction, you know, even if I look up like that, you know, you'll notice that my jawline here is a little bit more parallel. It's not quite as, as dramatic as hers. So, um, just something to kind of keep in mind. I think that's maybe one of the reasons why it's not completely as convincing as it could be. This looks great, too. I love this, but these eyes are a little bit too close together. So, I think this eye um, would be a little bit smaller, and this eye would probably extend to right here. So it needs to move over by about a whole inch and a half, perhaps. I mean, obviously it's something that comes with experience, and the more and more you do, the better you're, the more you're going to start noticing those things. Oh, are we... Oh, yeah, we're talking about Darlene's work here. I thought maybe I'd... All of a sudden drifted in someone else's great job. Like this. I like seeing this transforming into this great with the painted the your fingernails in your own artwork great the praying hands beautiful excellent too great job yes the wood beautiful excellent like a marble or something flying through the air nice leaf darlene great great leaf excellent leaves Yes, I remember this one clearly very well. And this eye. That's great. I think what we were just missing 
some shading in the corners of the eye, right? Because right now it's like this, the, the, the eye doesn't look like an eyeball, it just looks like an eye green, you know, it's just flat. And so we want to give some roundness to that eye shape by shading in the edges and underneath here where like so even look how the it's almost like the eye iris is coming over top of the eyelid so that black line of the eyelid should come right over top of the iris and clip that off so it doesn't make sense why this shape would it's, you know, this sort of looks like, you know, maybe you've got a contact lens with the Israeli flag on there. And then it's, it's like the, that contact is falling out of the eye and that's now in front of the eyelashes. You see how that, why that kind of needs, could be fixed. Great. Wow. Okay, so look how more improved this is. One thing is those eyelashes, it's odd that they're kind of crossing over one another like that. I think they should all just sort of be going in the same direction and potentially slowly changing in direction to go the opposite way. Wow. I see in the comments, Chase says, wait, can I send my art? on Facebook? Yes, absolutely. That's where all of these images are all from our Facebook community. The link is, it's the first link in the video description right below. So if your art is up on the Facebook group, I'll look and give you free feedback and celebrate your work here on the, on the next bonus episode, just like this. Um, excellent. Okay, so we're looking at Carolyn's work now. Wow, that is great. Uh, one little thing, it looks like the, these eyes are just slightly misaligned, right? Just look at sort of the bottom eyelid and look how close that eye is to the bottom eyelid. And then look at this one, look how there's so much more room underneath there. Now, perhaps that's how your eyes actually function, right? Um, everyone's eyes are different. Right? One of my eyelids tends to stay a little bit more open than the other, right? So if I'm drawing myself and I'm trying to be as accurate as possible, I would draw one eyelid a little bit more open than the other. Maybe one of your eyes appears to sort of go up a little bit more than the other. But if they are supposed to be symmetrical, then this eye should be moved down. Cool. That looks great, but the uh, face looks a little bit flat. Now, I don't know if that's just the angle where this is photographed from. But I think part of that is because those ears are kind of drawn um, on the face and kind of the, the, the rest of the face seems to kind of go behind the ears. Almost like this is a mask and it's been taken off and laying on the table and it's sunk in. So those ears are really popping out um, and so it's it's making the face look very flat now there's examples of people who have ears that kind of pop out like Barack Obama kind of famously right um, but even then we would we wouldn't see his cheek kind of go in behind these ears right that cheek would sort of end right at those ears so that's one reason that I think that's making it. And then also, so you've got sort of like a double chin here. So it's okay to have this chin, but this double chin would, would not have such a dark line like that. Again, it sort of makes that face look a little mask-like. Like we would expect perhaps part of the neck here, this to, the face would sort of just kind of blend right into the neck on both sides probably as well. And since we've got this strong light coming from the right, definitely this line would not exist here. And then you've got the shadow here, that works great. And then so we would probably have this side of the face would be darker and that ear would be mostly bathed in shadow. 
So that ear, instead of being white, it would be basically black. And by doing, because if we have all of this shadow on the left side of the face and then the ear has light on it, well, what does that tell us, right? If it's like, if the whole side of the face is, is mostly covered in shadow and then we have this one ear that is white, well, that sort of suggests that that ear has been moved up and it is sitting in front. So none of the face is blocking that light from darkening that ear. So it's like that ear is actually sitting kind of in front of the nose so that it can get light. So by just shading that down, it's going to make that ear look like it's it's in the shadow because it, the rest of the face is, is occluding it from the light. So I'll just put the... the Where's the... I'm going to put the, the link to the Facebook group in the description there for you, Chase, so you can easily join the group. Uh, here's some drawings by Barbara. Wow, these are wild, Barbara. Okay. Wow. Love these hands. Excellent. That is great. I love that you did the right and left hand, front and back. Really neat. I like seeing that all on one page. Wow. Wow. Great. Look at that. You really were practicing drawing the feet. Mm. That is great. Well done. I like these circular lines under the toes to darken them in but it also just makes it look like they are like the foot pads that they're that's, that's you're emphasizing that shape great nice beautiful beautiful oh there's my little girl great drawing way to go barbara excellent those are nice shoes beautiful beautiful <laughs> Great, that's great. I think maybe her eyes are a little bit close together, but that's okay. Oh, wow, yes, I forgot we did that too. Aging that face. Yes, learning about fabric, Mr. Burns. <laughs> that's great. I'm trying to remember, did, did I show this or is that an image you selected? I think that might be an image you selected. I don't remember doing that image. This very hairy old man like all the wrinkles in here. I think we still need to darken a few places. If you've darkened the eyes like that, which I love that you did, I think we might even see a little bit more darkness by his lips here. And then probably this left, well, where's the light coming from? I mean, this side of the face is, all, is lighter, so I'm assuming that's lighter, but then this is pretty dark there. So just ask yourself, where's the light? Where's, where's the brightest highlight? Because it looks like it's coming from different areas. On th on this area, it looks like the light is shining on the, from the right-hand side. But then this area makes me think the light's shining from the left-hand side. But then this tells me the light's shining from the top right. So, And then this tells me the light's coming directly from the front or maybe a little bit from... So there's some confusion here as to where the light actually is. And you can have lights coming from different directions... But uh, um, that would generally create a more even lighting. And so we, we, we might not have strong shadows at all. So And yet you do have some strong shadows. The nose is well lit and some down here. So I just want to sort of clarify those things a little bit. Excellent. This looks great, Barbara. Beautiful. So we must have... Did I get us to draw a big shiny ball or something like that at one point you gotta you have, you have to remember I, I did these classes three and a half years ago <laughs> so my memory is only so good here oh wow great I love how you've drawn her pants exceptional work Barbara beautiful great glass the one thing with this glass 
is if the top of the glass has this almost circular shape, then the bottom is going to have that in even more. However, if, if the glass is going to be kind of oval, then the top of this glass is going to be even more narrow of an opening because of the, the angle that we're looking at it in. So it's almost like we've got these should, these should be inverted. This circle probably would work best if it was down here, and this oval would work best if it was up there. Not a big deal, but just something to kind of be mindful of. Like, I think if you tried redrawing it and you just did exactly what I said, had the, had the bottom a bit more of a circular and then the top a bit more oval, I think you'd, I think you'd uh, see. Because otherwise it makes it look like this cup has actually been chopped down this way. And that's why when we look at it, we see more a more circular shape on top. Great. That's that's really nice. I like that a lot. Wow. Excellent. These are great. That flowing fabric is so nice. Excellent. I love that you did these. Did we do that in the class? Or, I mean, I asked you to, or I showed us how to do this, but I don't know if we did the journey to the moon. Wow. Dr. Caligari, did we? <laughs> Great! I love how you did this with scribbles. These this character done in little scribblies, really nice. Ooh, same here. Wow. Yes. Oh wow. Is that like from Moulin Rouge or something, or Chicago? What is that from? <laughs> Cassette. Wow. Oh, yeah. So here's the original Rembrandt. So remember I was saying like Rembrandt is like the king of the scribble, right? Like look how he's scribbling in, you know, to get these, the, the, the trees in place. And then how you've taken that. In fact, I think you could have a little bit more scribbly stuff going on in your drawing. I like you, how you recreated that. That's great. The signature. Okay, how many more? Okay, I'm going to have to... I only, we don't have that many left. Okay, that's perfect, because I have to go to a parent-teacher thing in just a few minutes here. So we're going to wrap up. I'll have to do the rest of the paintings that you guys uploaded to the Facebook group in another episode shortly here. Um... So maybe, maybe we'll try to do that. Well, maybe not. We'll give it another couple of weeks, and then we'll come back to that. Excellent. So what do we have here? An anonymous member posted these. Cool. Whoever you are, these look great. Huh. <laughs> like you sketched on the front of your sketchbook. That's great. That's cool. Like Wally? Is that what that's from? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I don't have anything to um, say here. I mean, maybe in, in your Wally, maybe we could have some darker lines. Like you've got these dark outlines on this figure here, and yet the other figure that's it's very close to the in the same space orientation towards us is not as defined right so and yet this one is and it's further away so i think this the this needs darker out if you're going to outline the one on the right with dark outlines i think you want to outline this one in dark outlines and then leave everything else a little bit less um uh, defined so that it kind of sits further in the background right do so you want to sort of treat things in the same space in the same way so that they occupy a similar kind of space. And then we have Alex here. Great job. That's a great job, Alex. I love that one. I like how you're using that soft blending. Beautiful. That is great. Look how far you're coming along. Do you remember the drawings you used to send in? Wow. Excellent. So there's the original. Wow. 
just epic. That's great. I mean, are there a few maybe small, like, proportion issues here? Maybe, but I really like how this drawing turned out. I think it's cool. Wow. Is that Sandra? Is that what we got here? And this is your drawing of her? Wow. Excellent. Huh. So that's interesting here. You know, the, the main difference between these two drawings is the hair. Look how dark this figure's hair is. You know, it's it's not black, but it's very dark. It's got a little bit of white or lighter blonde browns in there. But your drawing doesn't have that. It's much lighter. And so it, it makes it look like a different person altogether. Whereas I think if you just darken this hair in, it's going to make him look a lot closer to the original. You know, obviously, you're also the eyebrows need to be darker, right? And the pupil and irises, they could be darker. Um, I think that would make a huge difference. You know, you've kind of changed the orientation of the face. Like from here, he's kind of looking like that. And then in your drawing, he's now like that. But you've kept the hairline kind of consistent. So you see how his hairline is the same here as here, but the rest of his face is kind of lo now looking down. <clears throat> we need that hairline to follow the rest of his facial features. Unless you wanted to erase all this and shift it up. I think the easiest thing would be just to take that hairline and just bring it across here and then have that hair kind of come out over here over here all right and then boom drawing and obviously darken it i think you're gonna be way happier with that okay i'm looking at this beautiful ak rum wow cool nice job great job with this face i love how you've done the hair too very stylized in a way that i really appreciate i really like this i think here this line from her chin probably doesn't go all the way up to her ear. It probably is going to kind of fade out right about here. Because otherwise, if you draw that line going all the way ear to ear, it's going to make it look like she's got a mask on. And that mask is cover, you know, is, can be taken off. So you kind of just want to make sure there's not that such a hard line there. Ooh, cool. I like how this face is just sort of surfacing out of the white paper. And I, and I like, too, that you made that decision to raise the mouth, that you started with it, and you're like, ah, it's too too far away, so you erased it and moved it. Um, that takes a little bit of confidence because, you know, it potentially could be like a radical change in that drawing. That's beautiful. That would make a great tattoo. Wow, nice job with the reflected light coming from below onto that, ob that sphere. It looks very three-dimensional. Really well done. Another great... This, again, these would look really great as tattoos. I wonder, is that... Are those letter forms in some way? I don't know. Cool. Great eye. I think our eyelashes might continue towards the, the corners of our eye. Like, where do these eyelid... You know, the top eyelid is going to overlap the bottom eyelid in both places. And probably on one side, or maybe probably on this side here, we'd have the tear duct. Or no, maybe this is the corner. So that tear duct would be here. So rather than just sort of, I mean, stylize, you could stylize an eye like that, no problem. If that's how you want to draw an eye. Like I've seen a lot of like manga, Japanese comic books might draw eyes like this. And if that's what you're after, totally fine. But if you're trying to draw something a little more realistic, I think don't be afraid to... to, to draw those things in and try to make sense of how that eye actually functions wow great lips i like this outline here that little reflection on the top of the lip nice and how it gets so much darker that's a really nice study of lips i like that wow that's great very cartoony it's interesting that there's you know the way you've drawn the hair is it's stylized but it's attempting to kind of be a little bit more realistic 
and yet the rest of the face is very iconic, very just solid shapes, solid outlines. So those two kind of styles um, kind of merging together in one artwork. But it helps kind of create a differentiation between the, the look of her skin and the look of her hair. Oh, neat. Ermine or Beatrix Potter. Maybe we'll save those for that. Okay. So, um, as we get close to wrapping up here, I just want to share some artwork by Sanju. Once again... So, I've got to run to a, a parent-teacher thing right now. So, just as we we wrap up, um, I just want to remind everyone to please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so that you see future videos like this. And next Tuesday, on a regular scheduled time, we're going to be doing another painting by another one of my favorite artists. So, uh, if you want to make sure you don't miss those, then hit the notification bell. Subscribe to the channel. 60 to 70 percent of people who watch these videos and probably according to that most of you watching right now aren't subscribed to the channel right so subscribe to the channel hit the notification bell so that uh you know when these episodes are taking place and you can alter your notification settings so you could even get a, a text or an email to let you know when upcoming videos are taking place and if you want to participate in these episodes in the future Join the Facebook group. Upload your artwork to the Facebook group. That's where I got all of this artwork that we're looking at today. And if you want to support the channel, if you thought something I said about your work or other people's work has been helpful, then consider leaving a dollar, five dollars, twenty-three and a half million dollars. I mean, pocket change we're talking about uh, through PayPal, the super chat, and e-transfer using my email or contact me through email. To send an old-fashioned check in the mail. That's what's. That's why I'm here because of your generosity. So thank you to everyone for your support over the years. Um, so as we wrap up here, I just want to once again bring attention to this great work that Sanju has done. Um, he's in fact even using this technique that I was showing, taking making a frame cutting a little square out of a piece of paper and laying that piece of paper down onto the table or, or laying it onto a sketchbook and getting people or kids in this instance to, to trace out that square to give you an idea of, of and then you're going to draw what you see so then you, you put this piece of paper onto a table like, like for covering this ruler and pencil sharpener and then you try to draw that image into your sketchbook I think that's so cool Oh, that's great, too. I love that this girl cut out a... Sh it's not just a square, but this cool shape. I've never even thought of doing something like that. Great innovation, Sanju. That's... Especially for kids. Great idea. Very much appreciate that innovation. Really cool. Look at these kids. It's so... It makes me... It just makes my heart glow when I think of, like little kids learning different ways to express themselves to get more confidence um, in drawing and painting those things are really really important whether kids want to be an artist or not is totally irrelevant but when kids know that they have there's lots of different ways to express themselves versus just talking right or getting angry and smashing things or getting drunk or getting in fights and stuff, knowing that there's lots of different creative outlets for their emotions, whether that be drawing, music, dance, poetry, uh, sound, etc. I think is so important. And so just doing activities like this just lets kids know like, oh, there's like an infinite ways that I can express myself. Very cool. Great. Look at that. Excellent. 
And then this was a video you uploaded to the Facebook group with all these kids showing off their Jackson Pollock paintings. <laughs> I think that's so cool. Uh, and then this was another great story you put in there about how there was this little boy who saved up his allowance for a long time in order to be able to afford these, I think they're pastels or paints? That is so cool. Like, ugh, that makes me so happy. And look how happy he is to have, like, made that choice and how, you know, now he's got this these tools that he can use to express himself. Wow, like, this could be the beginning of, like, one of our the world's great artists right here. Right? And it's at such an early age to, to recognize that. So important. You, the work you're doing is so important, Sanju. It makes me so happy to be able to share this and inspire other people. That's so cool. Wow. I mean, these are the people that are going to go and change their communities and and uh, they are going to be the ones that take care of us when we get old. So it's important that we give them all the skills to help them uh, develop into the into great people. Okay. So thank you to everyone for all the great work that you put up onto the Facebook group. Uh, I'm so excited to see what you guys have been able to create. I'm sorry we ran out of time, you know, four and a half hours later to get to all the other paintings you guys put on the Facebook group. There's still another 200 images I didn't get to. So we're, we'll do another one of these episodes maybe next week or so. Um, and uh, yeah, and catch up and pick up where we left off. Thank you, everybody. You're doing great work. You're making the world a better place. Thank you for sharing your work with the world because maybe there's people out there who are watching but haven't don't feel confident yet to upload their own work to the Facebook group. So by you taking that risk and putting it out there, that inspires other people who are like, hey, my drawings are kind of just like that. That's I, I could do that. I could make art. I could do this more seriously than I've done thus far. That's really, really important. And I think it's, yeah, I'm just, yeah, super blessed. And ever I think about what you, you know, that I'm participating in this group, it makes me so excited. Anyway, have a great night, everybody. We'll see you again very soon. Thank you. Goodbye. You are all loved and important. I cherish you all. We'll see you again very soon.